Здравствуйте. Очень я счастлива, рада представить Влада Надалара. Он в нашем городе всегда желанный гость, а сегодня особенно. Вы большинство, наверное, знают, и, может быть, он в представлении не нуждается, но на всякий случай я скажу, что Младен Далар, профессор факультета свободных искусств, философского факультета Люблянского университета, он автор множества замечательных произведений, потрясающих книг, две из которых вот как раз только что вышли в этом году у нас на русском языке, в переводе на русский язык. Это «Голос и ничего больше», а также 10 текстов, изданные в музее Фрейда. «Голос и ничего больше» изданы издательством Ивана Лимбаха, которые будут сегодня представлены, сегодня нам принесут, а, да, и, и даже книжки нам принесут. Да, наверное, вы уже успели ознакомиться и почитать, и посмотреть, и, наверное, знаете про эти книжки. Еще можно сказать, что... Ну да, что, конечно, Младен представляет вот Люблянскую школу психоанализа, про которую все знают. Это ее такой главный теоретический, можно сказать, да, вдохновитель. И, и, кроме того, у нас... Да, сегодняшняя лекция называется «Субстанция как субъект». Лекция, как вы понимаете, посвящена... Гегелю — это такое введение в феноменологию духа. Некоторые знают, некоторые нет. У нас в городе существует семинар по феноменологии духа, который веду я, но не все знают, что этот семинар был вдохновлен как раз курсом, семинарским, целым семинарским курсом, который я слушала на протяжении двух лет в Академии Яна Ванайка в Мастрихте, где Младен Далар был нашим научным руководителем. И именно тогда я вдохновилась, эта идея пришла мне в голову. И, и давно уже вынашивала, была у меня такая мечта, чтобы Младен прочитал в рамках нашего семинара такой мастер-класс. Можно считать, что вот сегодня у нас такой мастер-класс, расширенный до откры открытой лекции в Европейском университете, и на этом я, пожалуй, закончу, да, если, если нет никаких таких, да, пожалуй, я закончу свое введение, уже передам Ладану слово, и потом у нас будет дискуссия, вопросы можно задавать, лекция будет по-английски без перевода, потом вопросы можно задавать и по-русски, мы постараемся перевести все и разобраться. Вот, я покидаю это место. Ладан, you can start. First of all, you, you hear me. Is this all right? Um, should I? Okay. I, um, I would first like to thank you for this invitation. Thank you so much, Oksana, for bringing me here. Uh, this is, uh, I think this is the fourth time I'm here at the European University in St. Petersburg. Uh, and I always feel very, very glad to be back. I only have best memories of the previous times I was, um, I was in St. Petersburg. And um, the, the lecture today will be sort of difficult. Um, I don't know to what extent you know something about Hegel. I mean, Hegel is the, reputedly the most difficult philosopher there is. Phenology of Spirit is reputedly one of the most difficult philosophical books ever. I cannot um, give you the, all the background that would be necessary. And I will just go straight to a very essential part, a very short sentence, which is the title of this lecture. And the sentence is like, substance is subject. This is the way it's usually rendered. Um, I, I hope you know something about Hegel, and you know, this is the Phenology of Spirit is um, a great book that he published in 1807, and it's, it was like a book to finish all books. It's a book unlike any other. 
It's not a book presenting simply a philosophical system. It's a book which tries to summarize or to bring together all possible philosophical approaches, all possible philosophical positions, and show, and show the way how they are interconnected, what the concatenation between them is, and how through very different philosophical approaches, the truth itself evolved. The truth itself um, had a historical development which brought it to the point where Hegel could write this, this book in 1807. So it's like a summarizing the whole history of philosophy, all, all different possible approaches towards the absolute, in order to bring up Hegel's own take on it. So, um, substance is subject. We are going straight to the most difficult, and since uh, life is short, <laughs> uh, there is no time to beat around the bush. The best thing is to straight, go straight for the most difficult. If you, if you can manage this, then the rest will be easy. It's kind of saving, it's saving time, you know, it's saving time, really. Um, so what is this sentence? First, it's a very deceptively simple sentence, but the most extraordinary thing is that this sentence exists at all. Um, because Hegel had... Uh, he was very adamant, he had a very strict stance that no philosophy can ever be summarized by a sentence. That there is never a fundamental axiom, proposition uh, that would somehow summarize all a result that one could summarize up in one single sentence. And I will read you two quotes to this effect. He says, uh, the dogmatism of the way of thinking in both knowledge of philosophy and the study of it is nothing but the opinion the truth consists either in a proposition which is fixed the result or else in a proposition which is immediately known. So this is the dogmatism, to think that there is a, such a proposition uh, either as a result or something that can be immediately grasped and known. And furthermore he says, any so-called fundamental proposition or first principle of philosophy, if it is true, is for this reason alone also false just because it is a fundamental proposition or a principle. So any principle whatsoever that you take is, by definition, false just for being a proposition or a principle. Because what uh, the, its truth, uh, where, where does the truth of this proposition reside? It, it resides in the development, in what comes after, what, can, what follows from it, what can be developed on the basis of this proposition. It's not a proposition as such that could summarize the fundamental stance of any philosopher. Huh? So, well, if, if this is a fundamental proposition, a principle from which we begin, it's only in its development, in its system, in its negation, in its becoming other, that the truth of this proposition lies, not in the proposition itself. So, if Hegel is adamant that this is the way that uh, philosophy should be done, then it's very strange that he sins against his own principle and for once in his life he actually proposed a fundamental proposition on which everything depends. So he shouldn't have done it, but he did it. And uh, this uh, sentence, is, I, I quote it now, the whole sentence, in my view, which must be justified by the exposition of the system itself, Everything hangs on apprehending and expressing the truth, not merely as substance, but also equally as subject. And I give it in German. Uh, das wahre nicht als Substanz, sondern ebenso sehr als Subjekt aufzufassen und auszudrücken. And in uh, his own table of contents, he summarizes this section by a simple sentence, the absolute is subject. Not quite substance, subject, but okay. So usually this is a longer way of expressing it, but usually this sentence is summarized to a basic tenet, substance is subject. So there is something um, um, some sort of disavowal in this Hegelian sentence. He says, I know that this is not yet anything to give this proposition, because it should be developed in a system. It's only the system which will bring out this truth. But nevertheless, I must give it as a sort of anticipation, a sort of abstract anticipation of what is to come, 
But this anticipation can only retroactively be, ma be made good. Huh? And you have always in, in, in Hegel, you have this movement of anticipation. You anticipate, you assume too much, you do it too quickly. You hurry. And then all this has to be recuperated in a backwards movement of retroactivity. So retroactively, this should be then shown as true. So uh, the sentence as such is not yet anything. Nevertheless, it is, a, it is something with which we have to deal. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean substance is subject? Why did he choose such a weird um, proposition as, as a proposition on which everything depends? Everything hangs on grasping the substance as subject. And what, what is substance? It's uh, already comical to <laughs> ask such a question. <laughs> it's such a big question. And uh, I mean, if philosophy could speak, if philosophy, it, there would be prosopopoia philosophy, uh, personification of philosophy, then philosophy would say, substance is my middle name. It's such a fundamental thing. Substance is absolutely fundamental in grasping any philosophy. And now I will um, sort of try to unpack first what is involved in the word substance, in six points. This is not what Hegel says, but I do it sort of, okay, didactically. Um, it's a simplification, of course. I mean, the, to give a history of the word substance, it would be a very, very big job. And anybody who has dealt with philosophy knows that uh, substance had so many ramifications, it went in so many directions. There is no simple definition of substance. But let's try. So, the first respect, if you look at the etymology of the word substance, it comes from substare, which means to stand under, so to be underlying. So, the first opposition uh, pertains to a spatial metaphor, a metaphor of space. It's something which lies under the surface, so it refers to a depth, as opposed to the, to the surface. We should get to some dimension which is under the surface. The second relation in relation to time, substance demands that we isolate something which endures through time, something that resists the passing of time, that resists the changes. So substance is supposed to be something which is not changed through the passing and changing of time. It should be fundamental in this, in this way. Um, third respect, uh, the word substance demands that we uh, isolate something that is necessary in relation to something that is accidental or contingent. So we, we are dealing with something which is necessarily there, not just contingently so, which just, just happens to be so. Fourth relation. Substance aims at something which is essential, at the essence, as opposed to appearance. And you know, the philosophy started by the supposition that appearances are deceptive and we must get beyond the appearances to some stratum, to some dimension, which would be truer, which would bear more truth than these shifting deceptive, deceptive appearances. And there is already a certain assessment of the capacities of human knowledge, like uh, we shouldn't be deceived by the sensuous perception, we should use reason in order to get beyond the appearance, under the appearance. Fifth relation. Substance aims at something universal. It stands for universality, something universally valid, as opposed to the particular and the singular. So there should be a universal uh, stratum under support, under the particular and the singular. And finally, the sixth relation, substance aims at a unity uh, as opposed to multiplicity. So it tries to grasp all the multiplicity, diversity of uh, our world by uh, bringing it to one single principle, one elementary single principle. 
And you know, at the beginning of philosophy, you had Parmenides, and from Parmenides, uh, there is this famous uh, saying, Henkai Pan, Henkai Pan, one and all. Um, so this, these are the shortest three words which uh, present the ambition of philosophy. One should somehow bring all, the diversity of all, to a single one thing, a one principle. And, uh, well, Nietzsche some, somewhere says, this is a metaphysical um, act of faith that we believe that all can be, all diversity can be grasped by one. This is a philosophical, very basic philosophical instinct. So, to make it short, the substance is uh, placed in six basic oppositions, depth versus surface, the eternal or the enduring versus the passing, the necessary versus the accidental, the essence versus appearance, universal versus particular, and one versus multiplicity. So this is what a substance should achieve. This is a philosophical program. We should get to what is depth, in depth, what is enduring, what is one, what is universal, what is beyond appearances. We should get to that level, and that would be the level of truth. <coughs> this is the program that the word substance, um, uh, it's a shorthand for that program. The word, the, the word substance is a shorthand for this philosophical uh, ambition, the basic philosophical ambition. And of course I realize that these six oppositions, they partly overlap and they partly pose quite different problems and they have been played out in a multiplicity of ways in the, in the history of philosophy. It's, this needn't concern us here for the moment. And now, okay, this is a sort of spontaneous uh, perspective that philosoph philosophy always adopts, looking for a substance behind all the diversity, divergence, heterogeneity of appearances. And now, okay, I come to my first coup, the Hegelian coup. Uh, if this is substance, if we define substance in such a way, then this would be a substance which is not a subject. So the whole Hegelian point is how to undo precisely those six traits which define the very notion of substance. How to work against these assumptions, against this spontaneous ambition of philosophy to achieve this level, level of substance. And, well, um, Hegel, and I will come back to this at more length at the end, how does Hegel do this? He doesn't abandon these words. He doesn't abandon these words. He doesn't abandon the word substance. He doesn't abandon universality. He doesn't abandon one. Uh, he doesn't abandon the word essence. He works with those words. He works with the same words that the traditional philosophy always worked with. He doesn't propose new words, like let's go for something completely different. No? He uses the same words, but these same words should work against the logic which brought them to a pattern, against the logic of their connectivity. So they themselves, if we look at them properly, would imply um, a logic which actually undermines them. We have to properly address their grammar, uh, their syntax, the, the way they are connected, the articulation, in order to undo this knot of substance, to, um, to do something else, to get out of the mode of substantiality. Now, okay, um, what could be substance? If we now move to a, more, a slightly more concrete level, so just slightly. Um, is it idea? Is it matter? Is it spirit? Is it God? Is it nature? Is it res cogitans? Is it res extensa? Uh, is it being qua being? All these things have been proposed at various uh, stages of philosophy as candidates for substance. And one uh, major question which arises, which uh, always haunts the, any class of philosophy, is the decision between the two big camps of materialism and idealism. 
So if we disregard some other possible candidates, how to decide? Is the substance the matter or substance is the, sub the true substance the idea or the spirit? And um, this is, uh, is actually a question which has been posed in these terms only in the 18th century. But once it has been posed, it seemed that the whole history of philosophy was a battle between two big camps of idealism and materialism. <coughs> now, um, Hegel, as you know, is arch-idealist. If you know anything about Hegel, then you know this. And what did Hegel think of materialism? What would be his take on materialism? Um, he thought the question of materialism was immaterial. Uh, but not because he would discard matter in favor of idea, but because matter for him was just as much an idea as any other. The problem is that matter is still an idea. It's worthy of all respect. He always respected materialism. And um, I will give a quote, this is from phenomenology, but later on, he says about matter. Matter is not an existing thing, but a being in the form of a universal, or in the form of a concept. When reason interprets the moments of the, the okay, well, the law that it matters, this is, a, this is from a certain part uh, from phenomenology, I won't go into this. Their essential nature has become for reason a universal, and as such expressed as a non-sensuous thing of sense, as an incorporeal yet objective being. So he uses this very paradoxical uh, formulation. And unsinnliche sinnliche, a non-sensuous sense thing. And incorporeal, but yet objective. And körperloses, doch gegenständliches sein. And further, he says, what is seen, felt, tasted, is not matter, but color, a stone, a salt, etc. Matter is rather a pure abstraction. And so, what we are presented with here is a pure essence of thought. So, this is Hegel's uh, argument about materialism. Who has ever seen matter? Nobody has ever seen matter. We, what we see are different colors, shapes, sizes. Uh, what we smell are different uh, smells. What we hear are different sounds. So we have all these sensuous materials coming from all sides, there with huge diversity, heterogeneity. And to say all this is matter, I mean, it's a major feat of thought. A major, what Hegel calls, matter is ein Gedankending. It's a thing of thought. It's a thing which has been produced by thought. It takes, it takes a great feat of abstraction to say all this is matter. So this is why he thinks, what is the problem? I mean, I don't have a problem with this, that everything is matter, because this just means everything is an abstract idea. Matter is a very abstract idea. You need a lot of abstraction to reduce all the diversity of the world, of being, to just saying, all this is matter. Huh? And um, so one, can, one, cannot see, one cannot see matter. It's a pure essence of thought but pure essence of thought to which we ascribe an objective being. So, in Hegel, this is like um, uh, an infinite judgment, like thought is matter, or matter is thought. You, know, you, you immediately equate two entities which have no, seemingly have no common measure, um, which are completely heterogeneous. You put a simple equation between between them. And this is pure thought, but which is externally existing. So, we, what, we, uh, come, uh, what we observe in matter is pure thought as externally existing. And you know this was uh, Lenin's uh, criterion for what is materialism. Materialism is a stance which adopts a, the external world as objectively externally existing not just a uh, figment of our mind. Huh? So, on this uh, account, of course, it's, it's objectively existing, but 
as objectively existing, it's still just an idea of our mind. It's both things. It's, a, it's existing and it's pure thought. Huh? So this is, this, is Hegel's, um, this is Hegel's take on materialism. It's, it's a very valid idea, but it's an idea. Don't fool yourself into thinking that it's something else. Huh? It's, it's, it's an idea, just as spirit is an idea. And uh, I will just underline this non-sensuous, sensuous being and incorporeal uh, objectivity, because uh, this is something which, this Hegel's formulation is something which recalls uh, the way that Marx will later actually qualify commodities. Uh, Marx, uh, which says, uh, commodity is a sensuous, supersensuous thing. So it's also a paradox. The way that Marx is a commodity, it's, it evolves this paradox of the immediate coincidence of the sensuous and supersensuous. But I won't go into this. I think we can go into this in, in, in the discussion. So a matter is not a matter of senses, and what is now wrong with matter? It's not that it's material and external and, and, and sensuous, etc. What is wrong with uh, materialism for Hegel is that matter is considered a substance. So this is the wrong thing. Not that it's external. But it doesn't get out of the mode of substantiality. If we just say everything is matter, then we didn't get the point of Hegel's sentence, substance is subject. So it's, for Hegel, what is wrong with materialism, it, it's, the, it's the answer to a wrong question. It's the answer to a wrong question about substantiality. It's not materialism as such that is a problem, it's equally wrong as idealism. If you say everything is an idea, you run into the same problem if you take idea to be a substance. So what we have to undo is the mode of substantiality itself. And this is what this sentence, substance is subject, aims at. Now, if one would look for a certain master word of Hegel, actually I think there is one. It's, it hasn't been often proposed, but this master word, which he uses uh, just offhandedly, it doesn't presented as a major concept, he used it offhanded in the preface to phenomenology, and in German it's sich anders werden. And actually there is a very good English translation which is self-othering, self-othering. What is the idea of self-othering? It's sich anders werden. And this goes, it takes a self as any kind of self, sich as any kind of sich, any, any kind of self can only become itself if it becomes other than itself. So self-othering. In order to be anything, it has to take the risk of becoming other than itself, of passing into its other. So the self is empty in itself if it doesn't take the risk of adopting the otherness, of passing into the otherness. So this is anders werden, and this goes for any entity. Any entity is empty in itself, but the origin is empty in itself, unless it takes the risk of self othering and then unless it produces the, uh, well, something that goes beyond that origin, something that negates that origin. In order to be anything at all, it has to adopt the otherness. This is, this is extremely basic Hegel stance. And why does this self, any self, do it? It doesn't do it because it's externally pushed to pass into its, into its other, because there's some external violence done to it. It's, its own, it's out of its own spring, out of its own nature, let's say, or absence of nature, non-identifiable nature, the nature which can, cannot coincide with itself that it has to, to pass into its other in order to be, to be anything at all. And um, one other way to, to present this idea is the idea of the fall. And Slavoj Žižek has written quite a bit about uh, the question of the fall. And you can, 
you can, okay, you can take the fall in the biblical sense. Like, there was a paradise, and then there is a fall from the paradise. This is the narrative which is usually given. But Hegel's idea of the fall is that uh, we start with the fall. We start with the fall. And paradise, which existed before, when an entity was supposedly itself, is a retroactive construction. So things have to fall in order to be themselves. I mean, they are not themselves in the supposed paradise of their self-identity. It's only after the fall that we can construct what they were supposed to be in themselves. Because before the fall, they were empty. We only retroactively have the idea of the fullness of origin. Origin for Hegel is always empty. It's the emptiest thing. It's not the full wealth from which things should then evolve. It's an empty thing, and only when we fall from this alleged paradise of uh, self-identity, let's say, only then can we retroactively see what supposedly preceded this. But uh, in our imaginary, we cannot uh, help doing a, a narrative, imagining as a narrative of some fullness of being which then fell. Um, okay. And it goes the same, this, this self-othering, this fall, is uh, very much connected with this uh, sentence subject, subject and one could say that uh, the subject is the impossibility of substance of being itself, of being simply itself, of being underlying, eternal, necessary, essential, universal and one. So this would be a short formula, subject is the impossibility of substance to be a substance simply coincide with itself. So there's always this quirk, there's something, there's a quirk in the substance which sort of pushes it to adopt its otherness. So there's always um, a cut, a break in this substance which then produces its torsion. And this, the name for this torsion is, is subject. Subject is like a torsion of this substance, the fall of substance, the torsion of this substance. And uh, it doesn't mean that subject is somewhere else, that we could isolate it as a separate thing. And Hegel was always against the dualism. No? It's not that we should, if this one substance doesn't hold, then let's imagine another substance which stands in opposition to it. This was never Hegel's position. His position was that there's something inside the very idea of substance which pushes it to its, to its otherness. And um, so the subject that we, we are dealing with in this sentence, in this sentence substance is subject, is not the subject which can be opposed to objectivity. It's not a subject which would <coughs> be standing against a thing, an objective world out there. The subject is already inscribed in this objective world. It's not, it doesn't stay opposite to it, it's, it's inner torsion, it's it already <coughs> in it. And this is why, by the way, okay, I won't go into this, but uh, you know, Kantame Su, uh, speculative realism, etc., the thing which has been around for the last 10 years or so, it's a very influential, widely spreading school, but Kantem uh, Meyasu, at some point, you know anything about this? Or is is Meyasu is right here? Okay, okay, fine. You know that Kantem Meyasu, he gives a, a, a very simple diagnosis of uh, modern philosophy, all philosophy, particularly modern philosophy is Kant, and this uh, diagnosis is spelled one in one word, which is correlationism. Correlationism there's a problem of correlationism is that we are trapped in the subject-object relation. And we cannot imagine an object which would be outside of a relation to a subject. 
And what he would want is what he calls le, le grand dehors, the big outside, which would be outside of this cage, subject-object cage. No? But this, um, I was kind of surprised when I read the book and also confronted him at some point in the, on this. Hegel, Hegel was never a correlationist. He never, his subject was never something which would uh, constitute objectivity. Okay, even Kant, I think, was not a uh, correlationist, but for an, other reasons. But in Hegel, it's obvious that subject, substance is subject, means precisely that substance is, uh, subject is internal to the substance itself. It doesn't stand opposite to it. And we never have this subject-object relation as a starting point. And it's inscribed into, into the substance. Okay. Um, now, if we, sorry, I must have jumped something. Just a moment. Um, I go back to the six uh, propositions and uh, give a Hegelian response to the six propositions in relation to space. Anything that lies in depth beyond the surface must come to the surface. So the spirit is spirit only if it risks to spread itself over the surface, Hegel says, this uh, sentence uh, from the preface to phenomenology. So the depth which would remain under the surface, it's not, uh, it's not a serious thing, it's an empty thing. It's only insofar as it comes to the surface that it shows its truth. So any depth must be cashed out on the surface. And there is a sort of heroism of the surface even in, in Hegel. Which brings him close to Deleuze. If you read Deleuze, you know you have all this uh, in logical sense, you have all this extolling of the surface. But you have this in Hegel as well. Second, in, uh, in relation to time, anything eternal must uh, adopt its... Um, must risk falling into the passing falling into the passing of time. And one easy way to see this is uh, Hegel's reading of Christianity, where he, ha where he says, he who died on the cross is the, word of, is, is the God of beyond. Which means God itself, if he was traditionally seen as a substance, must become man and die on the cross. He must come into the passing. He must take the risk of adopting finitude. Not, this is why for him Christianity was the, the last religion. Um, it's the religion where God himself becomes man and dies. And it, it's not he who dies on the cross, it's the God of beyond. I mean, he dies. He dies for real. So, um, so this is one way of seeing that anything that is considered as eternal must uh, adopt finitude and pass away. Then, um, if we think of uh, substance as, um, as something necessary as opposed to something accidental and contingent, then Hegel has this wonderful sentence that becoming contingent of essence, or the, yeah, becoming contingent of essence. Essence can be only essence if it adopts, if it takes the risk of adopting contingency. And that uh, it doesn't just persevere as, uh, as the essence. All, all essence must, uh, 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 must come to the fore. The necessity must become contingency, and all essence, this is the fourth point, must come to the fore. It must, it must take the risk of uh, appearing, of uh, adopting uh, the form of appearance. And he says again, a quote, uh, the 
form of appearance is as essential to essence as essence is to itself. So, what is essential, the essence that wouldn't appear would be an empty essence. It wouldn't be an essence. It's only through the appearance that we can see the force of an essence. Uh, then, as to universality, everything universal must pass into the particular and the singular. Otherwise, it's empty universality. It's, and this is what in Hegel is called mediation. Anything is, can be judged only by its mediation. No, not by what is supposed to be universally in itself. It must be mediated through the particular and the singular. And uh, as to the question of one, well, one splits into two. <laughs> to put it in the shortest formula, you know where formula stems from. One splits into two. I mean, there is no one which wouldn't in itself be already uh, an agent of split. Every one is an agent of split. So, in all these six counts, Hegel actually abandons the idea, the traditional idea um, of substance. And on all six counts, he tries to show that the, what substance was supposed to be protected from, like surface versus depth, Actually, it must adopt the thing from which it's supposed to be protected in order to be substance at all. It's only if it's courageous enough, if we think of substance in a courageous enough way so that it can adopt its opposite, only then can it be substance. If it perseveres as an essence, universality, oneness, unity, etc., somewhere beyond the divergence of appearances, then it's not a true substance. It's a bad kind of substance. Um, so everything depends now on this mediation. It's passing in its other. Every substantial trait must undergo the self-uttering, the sich anderswerden. OK. Um, I'm coming to the last part of my lecture. I would say something. If, if this is so, I mean, it would be, it would be very good if this, if this were simply so. But you know, you have many, many criticisms of Hegel. So what about Hegel asserting, for instance, telos, Hegel asserting totality, Hegel adopting teleology, Hegel adopting the circle of circles where everything must come together, in the end. What about all these things? So, if I, if I take telos in totality as two words which are crucial and which are very often used against Hegel. There's totality in Hegel, enclosed, self-enclosed totality, and there is teleology. There's teleology of progression towards the final, the final end. Huh? Because the, the way I presented the, the, this uh, sentence substance is subject would be against totality and against teleology. So how come that Hegel is at the same time the, um, someone who, who promotes telos and totality? Um, first, uh, okay, uh, telos and totality, we can... Uh, make a sort of uh, handy abbreviation, TT, TT. And if you Google TT, then you see that this was a, a famous Russian service pistol <laughs> <laughs> developed in Soviet army and uh, by Fedor Tokarev. It was a great success story and had many imitations and one is still currently used in Chinese and North Korean army. Okay, so have TT <laughs> as this, um, this sort of uh, monster. Um, now, mm, there seems to be hardly any bigger sins in uh, post hegelian philosophy than to subscribe to these monsters. And um, there is a narrative plot, a very general narrative plot. Okay, you can call it ontotheology, ontotheoteleology, 
you know, this is a Heideggerian word. It's like uh, um, 17, 17 letters, but uh, it's actually a four letter word. It's used as a swear word, as a, you know, it's a four letter word in English. Okay, uh, so it's used as a sort of brief diagnosis of Hegel and of metaphysics that went before. Now, what is the plot? The plot is that there once was uh, an era of metaphysics where telos and totality and all these monsters uh, reigned. And now we have a post-metaphysical thinking where we happily got rid of these monsters. You know? We happily got rid of metaphysics. So there is, this is the narrative of modern philosophy, of post-Hegelian philosophy. Now, what, what is wrong with this narrative? I think there's something deeply wrong with this narrative, but it, it's a very common assumption. I, I think that two, it, this narrative can be opposed by two theses. The first thesis is, there never was such an era. It's, it's a fantasy. Because if you look closely at the people who were supposedly metaphysicians, who were supposedly representatives of this um, era, what is interesting in them is precisely those elements of thought, those uh, uh, insights, those concepts, which, doesn't, which don't fit that mode the mode of metaphysics. What is most interesting in metaphysicians, the so-called metaphysicians, is always the elements which don't fit what metaphysics is supposed to be. This is why they are great. I mean, if they just corresponded to the onto theology, there will be nothing interesting in them. So the first, the first uh, element to oppose this grand narrative of progression from metaphysics to post-metaphysical thought is <clears throat> there never was a metaphysical era. There never was a metaphysical era which could be simply described by this, uh, the, the way it's usually described. Um, and um, the second um, thesis to oppose this narrative is we didn't get out of it. <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> There never was such an era, but nevertheless, we never get, got out of it. <laughs> there is still uh, a metaphysical kernel with which we have to deal. There's no, no such simple way of deciding. This was metaphysics from Plato to Hegel, and now there is post-metaphysical thought. Um, there are more interesting divisions than that. The divisions are multiple. The divisions are difficult to, to deal with. But this grand narrative, I think, doesn't hold. It just has too many, it just universalizes things which shouldn't be universalized in, in this manner. No? The fronts are different. And this is why we are here fighting on the Hegelian front, which means trying to enlist Hegel for the post metaphysical thought as a first, uh, as, as a, not, yeah, not the only, not the maybe not the first, but the, the thinker which helps us think against the metaphysical assumptions. And this is why I, I posited, uh, I started from this sentence, substance is subject, as a very handy entry into this. The Hegelian dismantling of the very notion of the substance on all major, on the <coughs> six major counts that is usually associated with. So, um, We can freely adopt, uh, espouse things like openness, mul multiple heterogeneity, proliferation of differences, becoming simulacra, fluxes, dissemination of traces, vibrant matter, contingency, chance, events, or object-oriented ontology, all those things. But still, we haven't done with the metaphysical problems. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's an easy way to... to uh, Get out, get out of this. So it's a kind of modern, modern doxa. We think that once was metaphysics, now we got out of it. Um, and one thing that one can, one, one symptom of this is the question of uh, closure and openness. And if you look at uh, 
criticisms of Hegel, very often they adopt this, uh, this parlance that in Hegel, okay, he's a great thinker, but you have this closed system, closed totality, everything is closed. And after that, we got into the open. We opened this closed totality, and this is why we can be now cosmophysical and free. You know. And um, I don't know, I, many years ago, decades ago, I did my PhD on Hegel, and when I, when I was studying uh, so many books, I got uh, a physical aversion towards the word openness. So many people who swear by openness um, and uh, then propose things which, is, which are supposedly open but which are actually far beyond, uh, far below what Hegel means by closure. I mean, give me Hegel's closure any time against uh, the usual idea of openness. And um, if you want um, okay, an argument for a, a different quarter, um, Agamben has a, a wonderful passage where he speaks about Kafka's parable of, of the law. And you know, the, in the parable of the law, this man from the country comes to the law and the, law, the, 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 the gates of the law are always open. The gates of the law are always open. And there he says the sentence, openness is the modern way of closure. The gates of the law are always open. You're free to say anything. Everything is open. There's nothing more claustrophobic than openness. And he says then, what did the man from the country manage to do in the end? He managed to close the gates. He managed to close the door. It's a great feat. This was liberation, you know, to close the openness. It's not like, let's open the, this closed door of totality and then we'll be free. It's actually that the openness itself has become the modern, our modern sort of way of enclosure. Right? The more things are open, the, most, the more claustrophobic the world is, the more we are enclosed. Right? And when Agamben wrote his one, the title of one of his books is uh, The Open, then the problem is not how to open something that is closed, but how to open openness itself, right? how to disrupt openness itself. Uh, this, uh, this general idea that closed is bad and open is good. This is the, the zero assumption. Uh, we must somehow dismantle this, uh, this opposition. Okay. Um, um, I will say that there is Hegel's strategy, which can best be encapsulated in this way. The best way to dismantle X is X itself. It's a paradoxical strategy. I already said in the beginning that Hegel didn't abandon any of the classical words. Um, essence, eternity, time, uh, substance, subject. He, he uses all the classical words. He uses the same words. But nevertheless, the concatenation of these words gets um, completely, it, it is completely different. He introduces a new syntax of these words. And Derrida says some, somewhere that there is no metaphysical concept as such. What is metaphysical is the certain interconnection of concepts, a certain pattern of concepts. It's not that some concept is as such metaphysical. Okay, what does it mean? The best way to dismantle X is X itself. I give some examples. The best way to dismantle identity, the notion of identity, is identity itself. Why? And this is his argument. He gives it a great length in the logic. He says, but look at the sentence of identity. The sentence of identity is A equals A. What does it mean, A equals A? How many A's do you see? One A has to redouble itself. It has to split from itself. It has to posit itself as other of itself in order to then equate with itself. 
the, the identity presupposes a split. It, it presupposes a split between two A's. You split an A and then you try to equate it with itself, but it's too late. It's the crack, the split has already occurred. Huh? It's the split which is fundamental for the notion of identity. So it's not let's give up on identity and espouse multiple heterogeneity and whatever. Just look at the identity itself, what it implies. It implies that an A becomes other of itself and this other is, happens to be the same as, 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 as the first A. But there's no way it can't be the same as the first A. It, it's been split for itself. The split has occurred. I mean, it's, it's incurable. Huh? So any identity is premised on a split. It's not, you cannot speak about identity without a split. So this would be one case of how to use the X as the criticism of X. It's, it's a more efficient way than to say, no, 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 we have no identities, we have all this fluctuating, fluctuating heterogeneity. It's, it's an easy way out. You don't use some other, we don't go somewhere else, we don't use other words in order to, to do this criticism. The, the very form of identity is, is itself enough to disrupt identity. Okay, the second, uh, the second example is more complicated, I can't explain it in more detail, but it's the pr propositional form. The propositional form, which since Aristotle's times is like S equals P, subject equals predicates. You have a fixed subject to which different predicates are ascribed. And in Hegel, the very form of proposition is a form of a transition. The subject in itself is nothing without its predicates. And this is why Hegel says that uh, the speculative proposition actually runs backwards. You first you, you have to read it twice. He says you have to read it twice. First you read it in this direction, S is P, but then you have to see that this subject which was posited at the beginning only acquires some consistency from its predicates. It's only the predicates who retroacti ret retroactively define what a subject is. So it's a fluctuation, it's a backwards, it's a backwards movement which defines the subject of, of a proposition. So the proposition form itself actually can be used as a form of criticism of what a proposition, proposition is supposed to be. It runs first in one direction and then backwards. Every sentence has to be, every true philosophical sentence has to be read twice. Okay, third example, the question of uh, absolute knowledge. Philosophy as endless striving from absolute knowledge, dispensing with doxa, dispensing with all false forms of knowledge, but Hegel's idea would again be the best way to do away with the absolute knowledge is absolute knowledge itself. And you know that uh, phenomenology finishes with a chapter on absolute knowledge. But what is absolute knowledge? What do we learn there? We learn nothing. What would that absolute knowledge be? It's an empty spot which only refers us to the process which brought us there. It's a completely empty spot which is nothing without the process which has produced it. And this is why Hegel says in the introduction to phenomenology, uh, the path to truth is truth itself. It's not like we make a long path and then finally we will attain some truth. On all the truth is on the way there. It's the way of production of truth is the truth. It's not like you get something in the end. And this is why the chapter on absolute knowledge is some way completely disappointing, because we don't learn anything. We only learn that everything already happened on the way. <laughs> we were expecting that something would uh, await us in the end, but no, there's nothing. We, all, all there is is the struggle we had on the way of getting there. Um, the, the fourth example would be Christianity, which dismantles itself. I already spoke about this. God becoming human is, is the disruption of the very idea of God, of any traditional idea of God, if properly read. Was Hegel an atheist? 
well, it's kind of uh, he, him. He's like, in, as in so many respects, he's on the edge. He's the last Christian philosopher and the first atheist. Um, because it, it, it is in his philosophy that for the first time, actually, God dies. God dies for real. This is, for him, the whole essence of Christianity. Um, the fifth example, um, I'm giving examples from very different quarters in Hegelian philosophy, but the fifth example could be the, the question of the state. And was Hegel the thinker of the French Revolution or was he the defender of the state? And there's sometimes there's a sort of a dilemma between the two. He was very enthusiastic as a young boy for the French Revolution. And how come that someone so enthusiastic for the French Revolution could end up as a defender of the state? But for him, the state was um, actually the realization of revolution. It was the way that the uh, revolution can get a stable form and endure through time. That, uh, that revolution is more than just a moment of temporary enthusiasm. Everybody is somehow enthusiastic about changes, etc., but then everybody forgets. <coughs> then everything gets back to the normal. Hegel's state would just be a way that not Precisely, that not everything would get back to the normal, that the, the very impact of revolution should attain a form which can endure through time, which can historically endure. And uh, last, the question of telos and of totality. The telos is there only if it can espouse, a, a fully espouse contingency, and totality can be thought only if it reflects its non-totalizable nature, which means if it reflects the crack on which it is based. So it's only it's the same as with, with the question of identity. There's a crack, there's a split, there's a break, which only conditions, conditions totality. Not that totality does away with the break. It conditions the very advent of totality. So, okay, his strategy would be hold on to the names, hold on to the words, but give them a completely different kind of logic, a completely different kind of syntax. What's in a name? This is Juliet's question on the balcony. Um, can one... Um, and she says, what uh, would a rose by a different name smell differently? It was, it would smell the same. Give it a different name, it would still smell the same. But Hegel's uh, question is sort of opposite of Juliet's. Can the rose completely change the smell by keeping the same name? That would be, that, that would be Hegel's challenge. You keep the same name. You say telos, totality, substance, essence, whatever. Only the smell changes. The smell is completely different. No? Uh, Juliet has this sort of commonsensical, okay, it changed names, but it doesn't affect things. You know, they just, uh, the, the rose would smell the same under any other name. So, keeping the concept as the best way of undoing the assumed connectivity, orchestration, keeping the name while changing the vector the smell which underlies it. Um, and, okay, I'll make, for coming to the true end, um, there's another aside, you know the, you know Freud's joke of two Jews in, uh, um, on a train, where someone asks, uh, where are you going? And the other person says, I'm going to Krakow. And then the first person explodes and said, you're telling me that you're going to Krakow so that I would believe that you're going to Lemberg, but I know for a fact that you are indeed going to Krakow. So why are you lying to me? <laughs> this, is, this is the Freudian joke. Right? Uh, the most famous, I guess, uh, joke from the, the Freud, Freud's books and jokes. And Hegel has a different strategy with this joke. He says he's going to Krakow. Everybody believes that he's going to Krakow, because he uses the same words. And he quietly makes his way to Lamberg. 
this would be the the Freudian um, Freudian way of dealing with this. Okay, I will give one last. I've been talking long. Shall I stop there? Shall I go on for a bit? Go on. Have some, okay. Um, I, will, um, I will briefly look at the notion of irony, which is, uh, which is a way of getting this point, which is a simple way, maybe a simple way of getting this point. Namely, what, what is irony? Um, you have a um, you have a classical definition which goes back to Quintilian. Quintilian, you know, the great rhetorician of, of antiquity, and he says in Latin, contrarium ei quod dicitur intelligendum est. So, so very, six words, but go very far. The contrary of what is said is to be understood. What is irony? You have a certain sentence, but you have to understand the contrary of what is said. And now what is important in, in this definition is that the sentence stays the same. The sentence stays the same. Okay, we have some primitive example of irony. It's pouring rain and somebody says, what a wonderful weather we are having. In uh, analytical philosophy, this is treated as the example, of, the major example of irony. Okay, it's the most primitive example of irony. Yeah? But... Uh, what, what is the point? That in irony, the same words can mean the opposite of the, what they mean. There is no linguistic marker. There, is no, there are no instructions for use. If you give instructions, if you give instructions for use, then it's bad irony. You know? If you say, I meant this ironically. Okay, this is lost. The irony is lost. You cannot say this. So you just use the same sentence, and it's up to the listener to decide whether this was meant at the straight value, at the face value, or in the opposite sense. And how can the listener decide? I mean, there is no, there's no marker. There's no marker. It's, it only depends not on anything that is present in the sentence. It depends on the subject of enunciation. How is the subject of enunciation placed in relation to this sentence? And this is why that I, I, I think I this. This is why I think this Quintilian's definition goes very far, because it, 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 by simplest means it shows the treachery of human speech. You use the same words, but you never know whether this was meant seriously at the face value, or the, the usual, whether the words mean what they are supposed to mean, or it means the opposite, the negation of it. So the same element is used as A and non-A. You say, what do you do if you use irony? You say A and non-A at the same time, in one. And this is why um, I'm using this, because Hegel is actually using this. At some point, he speaks about a Socratic irony. And uh, he says, well, what is great with Socrates? Well, OK, it's a longer passage in the history of philosophy. I won't comment on this, but the, the passage ends with this. He says, dialectics. The Allgemeine Ironie der Welt. Dialectics, the universal irony of the world. And I find this very beautiful, because irony is uh, supposed to be a rhetorical strategy, a rhetorical figure. Yeah? A paradoxical rhetorical figure because there is no... Um, it's, the sentence is, stays the same. If you say rhetorical figure, then you usually add something you know, to embellish or to amplify the sentence or whatever. This is what rhetoric is. You try to persuade by adding various things. But in irony, you don't add anything. The sentence sense stays completely the same. You know? So it's a rhetorical figure, but which for Hegel actually it doesn't pertain very merely to discourse, to rhetorics, to language. It pertains to the things that, it, that the language refers to. So it's not simply the language which is ironic. It's the world which is ironic. The language is part of the world which is ironic. Hmm? So you can see there the, the Allgemeine Ironie der Welt, the universal irony of the world. This is what dialectics is, that anything can be what it seems to be or the opposite at the very same time. Everything actually says, a and non-A at the same time. 
So th there is the embodiment of contradiction. There's the embodiment of contradiction in, in irony. And this is, why I, this is why I think this is a useful way of, of seeing, of seeing um, this Hegel strategy of uh, the best way to fight X is X itself. Which means precisely irony is uh, the distance between X and X. But X stays the same. It's, it's the same X. And when Hegel was uh, defending his, uh, his PhD in uh, August 1801, he had to write 10 theses where they would be <coughs> debating in Latin. And the first of these theses, I always found this completely incredible, the first, the first one of the theses in Latin is contradictio stregula veri, non-contradictio falsi. The contradiction is the sign of truth, non-contradiction of the false. So like a young man took on the whole Aristotelian tradition, which was based on the principle of non-contradiction. This is the basic asset the basic presupposition of the whole logical tradition. A thing cannot be true if it contradicts itself. And he sort of posited with the first thesis on the PhD defense that only things that contradict, only the contradiction can be the, the, the realm of truth. Only if things contradict each other. This, this is the index of truth. This is what we should follow. There is always A and non-A at the same time. Um, okay. Mm, I will use one very last thing, which is the question of uh, the Hegelian image of uh, circle, the image of circle of all circles. The circle can be. It's, it's very often used. Um, the Hegelian image of a circle as something, uh, as a diagnosis of the Hegelian system that, okay, he allows for all kinds of differences and divergences, etc., etc., but he, he only allows for this in order for everything finally fall together in a circle, you know? come, come together in a circle. And um, he indeed says, for instance, it is the coming to be of itself, the circle that presupposes its end and its goal, and has its end for its beginning, and which is actually only through it, this accomplishment and its end. So, a circle which presupposes its end as its beginning, is a coincidence of the end of the beginning, and the whole Hegelian idea of teleology can be somehow inscribed in this. And Derrida somewhere, somewhere speaks about the metaphysical obsession with the circle and the triangle. Um, if you look at metaphysical images, um, sort of gestalt of, uh, of metaphysics, it's either a circle or a triangle. And you know that also the triangle is uh, very much uh, used uh, for this Hegelian thesis, antithesis, and synthesis uh, thing. So there is a Hegelian triangle as well. By the way, Hegel never in his life used this triad synthesis, antithesis, synthesis. This was done 15 years after Hegel's death, for the first time. Right? So the way that he's usually summarized in, in school books is actually something that doesn't, have, that doesn't stem from Hegel at all. But, okay, this is another story. But, uh, okay, circle, one could rest the case if one just reads this. But now I have another quote from Hegel. And, uh, if we now follow this quote closely, the circle that remains self-enclosed and like substance, like substance, so he has this immediate equation between circle and substance, holds its moments together, is an immediate relationship, one therefore which has nothing astonishing about it. Actually, the, the German origin is better. As unmittelbar and darum nicht verwundersame Verhältnis. There is nothing in the circle that one should admire. It's not admirable. There's nothing. Nicht verwundersame Verhältnis. There's nothing admirable in the But that the accidental as such, detached from what circumscribes it, 
what is bound and is actual only in its context basis others should attain an existence of its own and a separate freedom an eigenes dasein an abgesonderte freiheit this is the tremendous power of the negative so is the end of the the quote so on the one hand you have circle and Hegel surprisingly says there is nothing admirable in the circle. What is admirable is that elements get are being abgesondert, that they get a separate existence. They are cut off, they are free from circle. They gain autonomous existence by espousing the accidental and the contingent. So setting free, cutting, asserting this proper existence as a freedom apart. So this uh, only a circle which would measure up to this could be worthy of consideration. Huh? It's not a circle which rests in itself as a substance. And Hegel didn't have a, quite a model for a circle which is not a circle, which should be a circle, but which should be based on, a, on a producing different heterogeneity, this abgesondert element, the separateness. And uh, I, will, I will end on it with this. Um, like um, 30, 40, 30 years after Hegel's death, there was uh, August Ferdinand Möbius who invented, you know, the Möbius strip. You know what the Möbius strip is. Yeah. Okay. So I think Hegel's circle should be read as the Möbius strip. Huh? And what is the Möbius strip? It's based on two things, on the cut and the torsion. First, you have to cut. You have to cut the circle in order to uh, reattach it to uh, get a maybe strip. And you have a torsion. And where is the torsion of the maybe strip? It's all over. It's not in some separate spot. I mean, it's the whole maybe strip is a torsion. And now, if uh, Hegel proposed substance as a circle, no? Then I would say that the subject is the torsion of, 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 of uh, subject is the torsion of substance. Like if this is a circle, I mean the torsion of the Möbius strip. This is the subject. But any circle which would be enclosed in itself has a torsion, but this torsion is all over. No? It's it's all over. It's not. Uh, it cannot be isolated to some spot. Subject is this torsion, and. What is, uh, what is this uh, the ubiquitous torsion? What, what does it mean? It's constantly split into two. Which means that uh, the eternal and the external, uh, the essence and appearance, the, all these metaphysical oppositions, they find themselves on the opposite end of the strip. But you know that the Möbius strip, actually, they are on the same surface. So this is what it means, that the essence must pass into the appearance. It's on the same surface. The essence is on the same surface as the appearance. The depth is on the same surface as, uh, as the surface, as it were. So for all the six oppositions that I, I enumerated, enumerated in the beginning, it, they all find themselves on the same surface, and the opposition is just the opposition, you know, that you have on a member strip. The two things are act actually are opposed. They, they do find themselves on the opposite end. But in spite of finding them on the opposite end, through distortion, they're actually part of the same surface. So that would be another image to somehow conclude this uh, idea of uh, uh, substance being, uh, being subject. So one maybe handy way to understand why, how, what does he mean by substance subject. So, what is the final point? The final point would be that uh, there is no simple way of persevering with Hegel, with the, our best, last, only philosophical option, something that we cannot go beyond, some ultimate horizon, but that maintaining the Hegelian names with their Hegelian twist, and to insist at the point of this Hegel's utter ambiguity would be the best way to find a way beyond Hegel to some new path of thinking and to produce a novelty. 
And this is where Hegel remains seriously the task of thought. Of a okay, surpassing of Hegel that would be worthy of him. I'll end there. Thank you very much for the lecture. Um, any questions, comments? Many people. Um, Preferably right. English, yes, if you if if you can. Yes, all right. I mean, this is um, this is this is a question which has a lot. Of, uh, there's a lot of background and um, history to it. I mean, particularly a lot of background and history because uh, Lacan was Kozhev's pupil, and uh, he always said I had uh, two masters: Clairambeau in psychiatry and uh, Kozhev in philosophy. He was sitting in Kuzhev's class uh, from 34 to 39, along with Sartre and Bataille and uh, so many other people. I mean, the whole generation of French intellectuals were sitting in Kuzhev's class. And, and so he learned a lot from Kuzhev and used a lot from Kuzhev, particularly the question of master and slave dialectics and, and also the question of truth and knowledge and, and stuff. And... Uh, he saw himself to a large extent as a Kozhevian, but also the, the, the criticism that he presented of Hegel was the criticism of a Kozhevian Hegel. So, uh, I'd say the first point would be, I think Kozhev is very fascinating. It, it's a fascinating reading. Uh, the trouble is just that uh, he was completely wrong <laughs> about Hegel. No, I mean, it's not... It's not a good reading of Hegel. It's, it's an interesting thought experiment, but as a, as a sort of scholarly reading of Hegel, I think it's useless. I mean, there's so many wrong assumptions about uh, what Hegel is supposed to be. And I find it actually, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sorry that Lacan, whenever he speaks about Hegel, he speaks about Kuzhev, and he doesn't really realize it. And he never said anything about Hegel which would be outside of the Kuzhevian grid. But having said that, I mean, I'm not simply anti kuzhev I think that wrong interpretations can be very productive. It's not like uh, history of philosophy is not about having a correct interpretation. If Aristotle had a correct interpretation of Plato, there would be no history of philosophy. He had definitely a wrong interpretation of Plato. But this is how you can see. 
it's extremely productive. And you could say this for so many, ever so many uh, philosophers. I mean, uh, wrong, wrong interpretation is a very good thing, sometimes, not always. And uh, so, uh, you know, that I would stand then, I mean, me and Slavo, and my Ljubljana friends, um, the whole stand rather for the asset that Hegel is the most, uh, that Lacan is the most Hegelian where he doesn't speak about Hegel, where he abandons this Kuzhevian thing and tries to do his own thing as a criticism of Hegel, which he means as a, as a criticism of Hegel, but which uh, actually turns out to be far more Hegelian than he ever imagined. This would be one kind of thing, um, uh, one important, the first important thing to say in relation between uh, Lacan and Hegel. But your question goes further, you know, there are other really differences then, even if you take that uh, the Lacan is Hegelian where he doesn't speak about Hegel without knowing it, um, is he nevertheless, is, there, is this the, the whole story, is the true story? And um, this is where things get really complicated, because I think that the key Lacanian I spoke about is substance is subject. And I think that the, the theory of the subject which follows from there is a Lacanian theory of subject. That Hegel actually goes in this, exactly in this, in this direction. The subject is the inner negativity, the inner split. You know? That this could be immediately connected to the Lacanian subject. And the question, I think, arises somewhere else, which is the question of the object. And you know that Lacan, uh, on, in, on, in several instances, said, there's one thing that I really discovered, there's one thing that is new, there's one new concept, it is the concept of the object A. This is which really goes beyond what has been hidden to what has been there in the history of philosophy or in Freud. So, um, the problem would then appear with the object, which is of course not the object of objectivity, the objective counterpart, no, simply objective counterpart of the subject, but this uh, paradoxical thing which doesn't go away, which uh, is not reducible to the materiality, which it's, uh, it's not, not deducible from materiality, not reducible to materiality, but which is not immaterial which is not immaterial, and which has to do with, uh, okay, this object A treated with, treated in, in, in psychoanalysis, and Oksana started with my book on the voice, and, and the book on the voice is precisely centered on the question of the object. The, the voice is the object, and the gaze for Lacan is the object. You know? So the question would be, really, if uh, my other book... <laughs> The book on the voice actually treats with a certain type of objectivity, which I think is not there in Hegel, not really there. Mm -hmm. so, so just uh, to precise, to make, to, to try to precise, you say that we can say that uh, you think that Lacanian uh, conceptualization of subject to subject is kind of Again. can be deduced from subject as substance. But what he adds is the how which uh, object can be correlated to such specific subject. Yes. And how okay. he you say that this is like, like an object. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Which is not an object. Uh, which is not the the Meyasu correlational okay. problem. It's beyond the Meyasu correlation. Thank you. Yes. Um, Anton. Ah, I have one uh, technical question. Uh, do you identify uh, subject with uh, catch or distortion or with hope? It's important because but you in this theory of subject, as I remember, uh, identify subject only with distortion, not with the cut substance. Hmm. So, no, no, it's, I it's important. No, yeah, yeah, it's an important question and it, it um, I I think I think I tried to answer it very precisely with the Möbius strip. Mm -hmm. um, the Möbius strip is premised on a cut. The fact that you have a torsion, first you have a cut. Um, 
you have to cut the paper in order to produce a Mobius strip. And then you get a torsion. So I think that the cut and the torsion are two sides of the same entity. I don't think it's... Um, I know what they're speaking about, about you, but... Uh, and this has important... Uh, I mean, if you, if you use the image of the cut and the torsion, this, this can give a certain perspective on the history of philosophy. Because, say, uh, Spinoza. Spinoza, uh, is, he's the philosopher of the torsion without the cut. He's all the time the torsion, you know, the things from substance to attributes, from attributes. To... Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and somehow, if you take Hegel and Spinoza, Hegel being the person of the cut, <laughs> Uh, Spinoza being the person of the Tolson, I think you have to read the two together. That it's the question of perspective. It's a question of a parallax, somehow. You either see a Tolson or a cut, but actually they condition each other. Uh, uh, well, thank you for a lot of really interesting uh, explanations. Um, I want to ask about the, the irony thing, right? The, the idea of kind of making irony central to Hegel's approach um, seems very ironic. Um, and, you know, ironic, especially because of his attitude towards the romantic irony of the, the, the Schlegel. So I wonder if you could clarify that. What, what prevents Hegel from becoming one of those ironists that, that he, he criticizes? Yes, absolutely. I had, I had this in the text, but I then left out because uh, I was running <laughs> far beyond the usual time. Uh, Hegel had a double relation to irony. And the first one was the Socratic irony. He was a great admirer of Socratic irony. And he says somewhere, I use the same method in my phenomenology. It's a Socratic method, which means that you let any figure of consciousness explain its own thing and run into its own contradictions. Not, not like teaching what uh, consciousness should, uh, um, should be thinking, but let, let it do its own thing, it will run into own contradictions, and it's, it's the ironic method. Right? It, the, the thing with, with the, the propositions will start functioning in the opposite way. <coughs> and at the same time, he had a contempt, a serious contempt for romantic irony. For romantic irony as an irony where uh, the subject, the ego, sort of uh, elevates himself above the world and is ironic about it. And um, it's an irony which is based on ironic distance. And I think uh, postmodern irony has a lot in common with the romantic irony. Or I don't know, hipsters. I'm, I'm doing this, but I'm doing this ironically. I'm quoting, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere above. I'm not uh, uh, the, it's, uh, the, the subject which uh, disentangles itself from, from this and sort of ironically quotes or ironically distances himself from its own qualifications. Um, so, um, to, make, uh, to make a simple point about this, one should, uh, I think, uh, distinguish between the ego and the subject. The ego is the one who can disentangle itself from the world and be ironic about it. The subject is an instance which is inscribed in the world itself, which is part of the universal irony of the world. It, it has no distance to, to the universal irony of the world. And if, if Hegel says universal irony of the world, it also means that there is no distance between discourse and the world, the, 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 the language that we speak and the things we speak about, between propositions and referent. That propositions actually are part of the referent, and the referent is ironic already in itself, in order for propositions to be ironic, or the other way around. And so you are on the same level, you're on the same level, you're quoting the same irony of the world. Whereas the romantic irony is precisely disentangling yourself from the world and looking at it with an ironic distance. And this is what Hegel was absolutely adamantly against. Uh, Ksenia. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, you began with uh, this etymology of substance, and it's something which rises uh, 
earlier. Uh, but uh, subject has the same logic, almost the same. And uh, uh, from the very beginning, subject uh, is hypopeminine, just as we have explored. And uh, when we say that subject, substance is a subject, uh, do we really deal with some kind of uh, uh, something contrary? Mm -hmm. Maybe just uh, a redoubling which lies under this um, contradiction. Yes, no, I like this line of thought. Yes, subject uh, comes from subjicere, subjectum, and this is why, because of this etymology, subject had uh, this double, is double edged, is double goes in two directions at the same time as in English. You know, you have uh, being the subject of my own ac actions or being the subject of the British Crown. Being the subject of the British Crown means that you are uh, precisely not an active subject, but you are subjugated. You know, to subjugate, subject and subjugate. So you have the active and the passive um, meaning of the word of the word subject. And in French it works the same, actually, sujet. Right? So, yes, um, I, I think that there is all this, I didn't go into the various meanings of the word subject. Uh, this would be two elementary meanings, the passive and the active one. But then there is a third which um, actually goes back, in a way, to Hippocaminon, uh, which is the question of uh, the syntactical subject. The subject in syntax, the subject of a sentence, um, and the assumption was that uh, the hypocaminon, the the substance, should be the subject of a sentence, of a, of a sentence, of a proposition. It should stand on the first place. Um, so, uh, in some way, if you took, if you, if you take it in this way, substance was always a subject. It was always supposed to be a subject, I mean a subject for proposition, to which you then ascribe predicates which are secondary. And so you have an overlapping of various layers of this, uh, this word subject, which I like, which I think can be used and can go in the direction I was developing. But I left out actually the etymology of the subject and the various um, ways that this can be used. But yes, I think it actually enhances the uh, the basic stages. Um, I have a good question about uh, Hegel and the uh, first question is uh, do you agree that being it is nothing and uh, that all um, uh, around nothing uh, all symb symbolical senses uh, that empty Enigmas, enigmatic things. Um, it is a uh, fund fundament, uh, basic of ontology. Uh, basic? Ba ba it is basic, basic things. Uh, uh, nothing, emptiness, um, darkness, maybe too. Uh, it is uh, a fundament, basis of ontology. Fundamental uh, basis. Human being. Uh, being of the universe, of the universe. Mm. Okay, in, in the beginning of logic, he has uh, starts with pure being, and then you have pure nothing, and then uh, saying that pure being and pure nothing are the same. And he there uses, he often actually uses this, uh, this argument, this metaphor, that if we say being, and if we say nothing, we imagine something completely different. So it's the same thing as we, if, if we say light and darkness. We imagine something completely different. But actually, in pure light and in pure darkness, you cannot see anything. It's actually the same thing. It, as content-wise, it's the same thing. You can imagine something very different. But in either complete light or complete darkness, there is nothing to be seen. So, this is Hegel's argument about uh, the sort of coincidence of 
being and nothing is completely empty. <laughs> em empty concepts. The, the concepts con uh, empty of any particular contempt. So you start with this, uh, with this supposition that the uh, light and darkness are not two different things. They coincide. Being and nothing are not two different things. They actually hang together. Mm -hmm. That would be, but this is the beginning. The fact that we have two different words for this, the fact that we do differentiate between being and nothing, between light and darkness, is not innocent. It, there is actually a difference. A difference which is not a conceptual difference, which is not a difference of content. It's a formal difference. The formal difference is for Hegel extremely important. It starts from a formal difference, not from a difference of content. Uh, something that cannot be discerned, but is nevertheless discerned. This is enough for him then to start the whole machine in, in logic. So the, the basic thing is not either being or nothing, is the difference between the two. It's the non -con difference not based on any content, but the formal difference between the two. That's it, like this. <coughs> How do you think uh, maybe we live uh, in the space uh, without philosophy? We live in the space uh, when the after end of philosophy. We speak about philosophy, we write about philosophy, but we have nothing philosophy in the contemporary world. But you think there once was philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> now it's maybe now now it has ended. Hmm? <coughs> maybe. The last philosopher. No, no, well, he would be very honored. I mean, he, he indeed <coughs> thought of himself as the last philosopher. He, he was a great uh, man of proclaiming the end. He proclaimed the end of art. He proclaimed the end of history. He proclaimed the end of philosophy, you know. And, uh, and the strange thing is that he somehow <coughs> succeeded. There was an end. There was an end. There was something. Something has ended this way. And something completely different began. I mean, something, mm, an afterlife, an afterlife of the end began. <laughs> so we are in the time of the love, afterlife of the end. The end is a, a very major task of thought. Maybe you are, uh, we don't, uh, I think, uh, absolutely the end uh, of philosophy. It is now with this uh, process. We have a new process of philosophy where the fact of the end of philosophy has to be taken into account. Yes, there was an end. Nevertheless, there was an end of Sitnira. Yes, and you can see you can see the same thing in art. You know, there, there was a there was a break. There was a break. If you look at Hegel's aesthetics, there's a great paradox in this that uh, at the time when Hegel proclaimed the end of art, that the art is a finished thing in his aesthetics, was the first time in history with that, that the, the slogan was launched of l'art pour l'art, art for art's sake. The first time that art could come on its own and say, finally, art for art's sake, we don't give a damn about religious, social uh, considerations or anything, it's just art for the sake of art. No? This is precisely the historical moment when Hegel proclaimed the end of art. And what has art been doing since? Well, I think modernism, the, it, it's, not, it's not that no art has been done after that, but the, the problem of the end of art is, has become an object of art. And this is one way of defining modernism, but the problem of the ending, of the end of art, is actually its internal problem. This is Agamben's argument, by the way. He, Man Without Content is the title of the book, but where he deals with the question of the end of art in Hegel. It's not that uh, art has ended, but he, it, it continues, as Hegel says, an sich vernichtendes, something annihilating itself. And this is a good definition of modernism. Um. Yeah, that's, uh... <laughs> 
такое интересное, интересное поворот искусства произошло в ответвлении в исламе на вопрос последнего вопроса. Это вопрос о фото. Если я услышал вас хорошо, вы ответили Lord, uh, we start with fold. Fold, fold. fold. The fold. 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 Uh, yeah. and the board, and <laughs> who are these women? Ah. <laughs> this was my question as well. <laughs> who is the we? <laughs> no, who are these? <laughs> Mm-hmm. Okay, no, I, I wasn't quoting Hegel there. Um, I, I somehow... Um, In your words? This were, these were my words. Yeah. This were my words. The, uh, the, a more cautious way of saying it, one, one always starts with a fall. One always starts with a fall. <laughs> it's like a, this uh, impersonal we that they, I used. But uh, the question of I and we is actually very important in Hegel. There are very, very few instances where Hegel says, I, ich. Um, he very, very uses, uh, uses this word, I think six times, you know. But he's always underlined this ich, you know, when he says I. Because there's always this sort of, uh, this, um, sort of general collective subject, which is a uh, philosophical subject who is progressing. Um, it's not Hegel himself. But at the same time, we is a very important category in the phenomenology of spirit. Because when he says we, yeah, it's completely different from I. We can see what the consciousness cannot see. We are standing somewhere behind the back, hinter dem Rücken des Bewusstseins, behind the back of consciousness, and can see what actually happens with all the work is done by consciousness itself in the phenomenology. It's the only subject who works is the consciousness. But nevertheless, we have the privilege of standing behind the back of the consciousness and seeing something that the consciousness structurally cannot see. So the consciousness is consciousness as long as it has an unconscious. It's not conscious of its own, of the impact of its own doing. Um, does this mean that we are a kind of uh, an unconscious of the consciousness? Yeah. Well, uh, we. Um, I don't know. We have a, there's a certain Heideggerian reading of, uh, of phenomenology, um, uh, which I don't particularly like. But uh, I mean, it has some very good moments. But um, his lessons on phenomenology of spirit from 1934, I think, and where he somehow it's very puzzling to me. He says it's the, the phenomenology is a dialogue between us and the consciousness, like us philosophers and the consciousness. I don't see any dialogue going on at all <laughs> in phenomenology. It's always the consciousness who does the, all the hard work. You know? mm-hmm. We are not a dialogue partner <laughs> at all. And if we were to teach consciousness how to avoid all these traps that it's, it's constantly falling into, you know? then that this would be a process of education. It wouldn't be a phenomenology of spirit. The phenomenology of spirit is a process of self-education. It only what the consciousness learns by itself is worth anything. If we were to tell it, don't go this way, this very middle, this will finish badly, <laughs> then this wouldn't be a phenomenology. Oh, I... Um... I'm actually very interested in this uh, we uh, in phenomenology and uh, in our seminar we uh, sometimes uh, interpret the we as us, ourselves, so that uh, we, we have this, uh, this structure, uh, these two uh, instances uh, uh, in Hegel. One is uh, it, the consciousness, that doesn't know that sometimes is blind, but, but it acts, acts in, in its, um, in its uh, it is on the way. Uh, and, uh, and we, uh, 
and we know and we always know uh, sometimes it thinks but we know uh, and they have a feeling that um, uh, still sometimes uh, we do uh, provide some support for the consciousness um, uh, we do intervene uh, in several at several points uh, say uh, there are uh, like I would say micro passages uh, um, passages and the macro uh, macro passages uh, in uh, the way of consciousness uh, to the absolute knowledge uh, and uh, these micro uh, passages they um, they happen uh, within one uh, form of uh, of the appearing of uh, consciousness uh, uh, say um, say I don't know the the first one uh, sensuous perception within the sense uh, sensuous, uh, sensuous perception it does all all the job itself and we follow but uh, in between the uh, this level and uh, between the, this level and the next one we somehow um, kind of uh, intervene from the future and bring uh, bring him or it to the next level I don't know maybe I'm wrong uh, but I think this is a, a very productive collaboration because without this it, without this consciousness itself, we uh, could not be possible at all. We would, would never appear here in, in this room. Um, so we are the result of this consciousness. And as a result, uh, retroactively, we uh, intervene um, sometimes at a certain steps in order to make us as a future um, to be uh, realized. Uh, somehow uh, to come to to truth uh, I don't know or uh, am I clear yeah uh -huh. sure sure yeah. <laughs> no, I'm wrong. Yeah, the, the, the two important things first without the consciousness we are powerless now, we we don't possess the power the fact that we know doesn't help it doesn't change anything we may know but it's empty so it's only the consciousness which gives reality to us and second thing is that we are, uh, it's not our special knowledge which qualifies us as us. It's a structural position. Anybody can be us. Right? Just as anybody can be conscious, anybody can be us. It's a structural position. It's a point of view. It's not a substantial position in the sense that we know something that the consciousness doesn't know. Right? We, we are placed, I mean, the, the fact that you are placed behind the back of consciousness, I mean, it's quite literal. It's, uh, we just have a perspective that the consciousness cannot assume. So the consciousness is indeed blinded in its uh, endeavors, but it's not simply blind. It's, the bl it's, it's blinded, it, its blindness enables it to progress and to know. So it's a structural kind of blindness. It's because it makes blunders simply, that it progresses and, and learns. Right? It constantly makes blunders. It goes from one blunder to another. But it's only because there is a blindness on one hand, there can be insight on the other. If I use this uh, Paul de Vaughan book, famous, uh, blindness and insight. This blindness and insight hang together. So it's a sort of um, blindness is something that enables insight. It's not simply a shortcoming. It's, it's, a productive, it's a productive thing. But then, to what extent do we really intervene in, in the thing? It, there has been a lot of debate on this, because Hegel basically says the rules of the game are such that we shouldn't. Right? So, is he somehow not abiding by his own rules at some points? And already, in the sense perception, which you, which you may have, the, the sense certainty, which you mentioned, um, I mean, in the very beginning, he says, uh, who is the one who asks, what, uh, what is now? <laughs> what is here? And, you know, it starts with uh, sentences like, now is a day, and, uh, here is a tree. And, and uh, who is the one who says, now write down this thing, now is a day, and look at it when it's night. It is still a truth. <laughs> 
So who is the one who somehow gives instructions? Like uh, uh, there is a sort of my mini dialogue going on. No? Is it already we, no? pushing the consciousness in a certain direction, or is it uh, consciousness itself, which, if it is to sustain the position of uh, of said certainty as being the source of truth, nevertheless has to say something. No? So. The, the question arises already on the very micro level uh, of what is driving consciousness. Do we intervene or is it something in consciousness itself which actually pushes it to assume in this position and to, if it assumes this position it has to do certain things. So the line is very thin. Yeah, I think that uh, we and it uh, are uh, just uh, put together in the member strip also. Oh, it's the same uh, structure. It is the cut, yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yes. Maybe can, can you say that this sense essential certainty is the first fall of we? I mean, is it, is it or there's no such connection there? Any? No, I don't think that in sense certainty, which is the first uh, yeah. chapter, I don't think that I mean, there. The whole chapter begins with the fall of we and we. I mean, we, uh, is, is there, is yeah, it right. there that, that split between like the conscious or whatsoever, what is traveling and the uh, we? Are we fall into yeah, the individual we, consciousness yeah. and then we, as we, we and as then, we, then we follow. And then we become uh -huh. a, something that is traveling through this episode. <laughs> Well, the, the point of phenomenology is that I and we would coincide <coughs> in the end. But do we co coincide in the beginning? I don't think so. No, between, between the um, spaces, <laughs> let's call it that. Uh, I mean, uh, when we jump from one uh, scene to another, do we, uh, can we say that we're doing it through that we? Through a we, uh -huh, uh -huh, I see what you mean. So we, when we progress from one figure of consciousness to another, is there a we intervention? Yeah. Um, I mean, on, on Hegel's account, no. I mean, it's precisely well, one of the major functions of we is precisely the transition between one figure and another. Where he says that the consciousness finds another figure as if contingently. As if, now, this didn't work, now let's try something else. Huh? It's basically like this. But uh, uh, what it cannot see is that the two things are internally connected. That this was actually a necessary transition. That from the point of view of consciousness, it always appears as some sort of contingent find. Let me try something else. Maybe this will work. No? And you don't see why the thing that you somehow contingently find is actually the response to the inner impulse of the previous figure. This is how Hegel okay, lays it down in the, in the introduction. I mean, this is his own rules of the game. But uh, of course, there is always this question whether he abides by his own rules through the terminology. Yeah, so uh, maybe another way then, uh, that uh, maybe the, uh, this thing that is traveling through the situations, uh, is the, it's like the savior, because we put in, it's in the like, reality, in, the, in its different aspects, and the we is uh, just the people who will be saved by the sacrifice of the savior, this multiple sacrifices, so how do you think this, uh, is this metaphor useful or useless? I mean, uh, are we to be saved yeah, by the consciousness? Sense. Yeah, yeah. In a sense, yes, because uh, as I said, I mean, consciousness does the old work. I mean, so we, we are, we is a passive instance, yes, yes. We is the observational Just passive instance. It, it doesn't have a, an agency of its own and it's, this is how Hegel describes it. Yeah? It's a structural position from where you can see something that consciousness cannot see. 
but the fact that consciousness cannot see is also productive of its own uh, experience. And the first title of the book was The Science of the Experience of Consciousness. This is how he envisaged the project. It grew up, I mean, enormously, out of all proportion. But uh, the initial project was the Wissenschaft for the Erfahrung des Bewusstseins, the science of the experience of consciousness. But that's, uh, that's also how Kozhev explains uh, this uh, position between uh, consciousness and we. Uh, consciousness is uh, dialectical, he says, so it acts, uh, whereas we only observe. Uh, and that's why it's called phenomenology, because, uh, and not a dialectics. And mm -hmm. he argues that phenomenology is not a dialectics. Uh, but uh, I, um, I just think that uh, the very... Um, this very uh, point that we know uh, that there is a passage from one uh, form to another mm -hmm. is an intervention. Uh, so I think that knowledge uh, somehow acts retroactively in the history of consciousness. Uh, so the uh, consciousness moves one way and the knowledge uh, somehow makes a circle um, around it uh, and uh, uh, it um, made this uh, it makes this passage uh, possible by uh, knowing it or by taking it into account or uh, making it a narrative uh, in the book that's that's how i was uh, imagining it uh, so i i think that we is uh, somehow stronger than this simple uh, passive observer uh, that uh, we we is almost a virtual collective uh, of a huge uh, of a, some future beings that would never uh, that uh, that would only become possible through this process, and um, they are somehow always in this point of um, uh, semi utopia <coughs> or almost virtual existence. I mean, you know. mm. and they uh, so they intervene and they help hush consciousness to. Well, I, I'm repeating myself. That's um, yeah. I just think it's more. Uh, it's a more rich uh, concept. Uh, it's interesting um, this way. But do do we have blind spots? Because consciousness has blind spots, I and mean, this is what defines the consciousness. But do we have blind spots? Because we somehow have the privilege of not having blind spots, but only on condition of not acting. At the moment, one acts. One has blind spots. This is Thierry's he he theory of action. You, you cannot act so that you would be fully in command of the consequences of your own action. And then the one who wants to be in, only in command of the consequences of one's action is the beautiful soul, who doesn't act. <laughs> because the, anything one does can have very bad consequences. Right? One cannot <coughs> control them. So when it's structurally blind one acting, well, you have to thrust yourself into the action, although you don't quite know what might result from it. But uh, unless you thrust yourself, you, you just remain a beautiful soul. As a sort of thing. So is we a beautiful soul in this um, respect? No, um, I think uh, one act uh, and, uh, and, we, uh, and we know. Um, but one is never we, uh, so and we is not uh, is not one. Uh, mm, the one who acts uh, acts as one. Um, yes, the, yes. This is why I said that we yeah. is a structural position. Mm -hmm. it, it shouldn't yeah. be in any way pinned to any particular subject. It's just a yeah. structural position. Uh, kind of following that direction, I have a question that is not quite. Myself, I suppose, but it, it touches, I guess, like uh, the break between Marx and Hegel. Because, uh, well, as I see it, like the, um, the reason why Hegel is a conservative philosopher it, is that, like, in his philosophical procedure, which he carries out in like, both phenomenology and then later in, say, philosophy of right, uh, what we get is that, like, every stage of of consciousness, say like every uh, is has has this work of reason of the universal subject of the absolute subject behind it. So there is like universal logic for 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 every gestalt, uh, right? So 
when we uh, turn this, um, uh, when we like address the state with that approach, then we get the reason behind every instance of right, every like uh, legal operation, say property, family, etc., etc., etc. So this becomes some kind of a legitimation, universal legitimation for the abstract universal subject for the we, which could be collective and revolutionary, but could at the same time be like you know the I don't know. Um, I mean, in that sense, if like we turn it into some kind of uh, joke, then like becoming uh, uh, becoming of uh, substance becoming subject in Marx, what does that stand for? Does it stand for like capital becoming subject, capital becoming us, or what? Uh, so, what? How do you view the the Marx Marxist critique of Hegel uh, uh, in that regard? Mm -hmm. No, this, you know, it's a, it, it's a very large question. It's a very large question. And um, first I would say in, in regard to Hegel's theory of the state as legitimation, as you said, this is the way it is really read. And to that I would only add that uh, Hegel's uh, theory of state was something that was historically defeated. It was never realized. You know? The way that the states that emerged in the 19th century were of a completely different make than the, the state that Hegel imagined. And the state that Hegel imagined actually was not the Prussian state at the time, not at all. So there is a, there is a certain critical potential in his state. Um, it was not uh, legitimizing a particular historical form of state. It was uh, critical to any particular form of state. But then as to Marx and, uh, and Hegel, you know, this is a very large question, and um, I started saying something in, in the paper, um, which can be used as a sort of a entry point for an answer, where um, uh, I'm um, enthusiastic about this uh, Hegel's uh, um, saying that uh, matter is a sensuous, non-sensuous thing, um, which is sort of the electrical um, formulation and körperliches and auch gegenständig, ein körperloses und auch gegenständiges Dasein, uh, um, bodiless but objective, nevertheless objectively existing uh, thing. So th these are qualifications that Marx actually gives to commodity to commodities. He says commodity is a sensuous, super sensuous thing. It seems to be a very sensuous thing, but it's full of metaphysical quirks and theological niceties. And it's a quote from the Capital. So it's, uh, in one sense, it seems very palpable and sensuous. In another sense, it's the embodiment of theology and metaphysics. There's high metaphysics going on when we deal with, uh, with commodities. This is Marx's view of things. No? So uh, one way of reading it is that Hegel unwittingly actually provides the theory of, uh, let's say, commodity world, that the world uh, uh, that we witness in capitalism, that actually Hegel, without thinking, he thinks always in these most abstract terms and uh, without any presuppositions, thinking should be done without any presuppositions, but then it turns out that he had ever so many historical prepositions presuppositions and that he actually described the world, the emerging world of capitalism as a sort of universal uh, thing. So this is, this is one view which has been, which is encapsulated in early Marx and which has been a, a number of times reiterated in, in the history of Marxism. And also Adorno says this, that Hegel's system is like a huge capitalist system, which each part is indebted to another part, but the whole is without any debt. It's like a perfect capitalism. Everybody is indebted to everyone, you know, but all things function, but the whole doesn't have any debts. So this is one view. And but you had the completely opposite view in the history of Marxism. If you look at Lukács, what the way that Lukács conceives the proletariat and the uh, emancipation is profoundly Hegelian. It's profoundly Hegelian, where you see that the logic of emancipation against capitalism, 
against the fremdom, against the Taisa. What, what logic can one use? It's precisely the Hegelian logic. The Hegelian logic of the this world of commodities which, which stand as, as alien and foreign to us, as external, which we must reappropriate through the point of pure negativity. Subjectivity is pure negativity. And what is proletariat? It is a Hegelian subject in this sense. It is a subject of pure negativity, right? which precisely because it's negative, because it's this Inbegriff aller Nichtigkeit, says Marx, the condensation of all of all nothingness. And Marx uses the very Hegelian language when he describes the proletariat. It's only because it's, it, it reached this point of sheer negativity that it can reappropriate the, the substance, the whatever, the, this materiality, the objective world, which stands as foreign and alien against, uh, against it. So if you look at the history of Marxism and also Marx himself, you have this very this great paradox that uh, you take Hegel to be the unwitting theorist of uh, commodity world, and you take Hegel to be the unwitting theorist of revolution. Right? Because we can think of the commodity world in Hegelian terms, but we can only think of revolution in Hegelian terms. Right? So there is this ambivalence in Hegel, this ambivalence of, uh, I think, uh, both. Uh, um, I think both both things are true. <laughs> I mean, as ma so many times in Hegel, he, he's on the edge. He's on the edge between two things. And uh, I always try to stand for the negative revolutionary Hegel, as it were. But I am perfectly aware that the other Hegel is there, and that it's not the, the, it's the, the rift between the two that is a true Hegel, as it were. Huh? I, I adopt a certain rather extremist view of Hegel because the other view is so prevalent. And I think it, 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 the other view just somehow doesn't allow us to see what is really productive in Hegel. And I think it's very productive, really, this view is. As someone would say, reactionary or revolutionary, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like this in Hegel, yeah. somehow, yes. Uh, Kirill. Could you summarize, in short, uh, the important features of the Hegelian subject? This is the first question. Uh, in short, and uh, what is the place uh, which uh, takes uh, Hegelian subject in uh, <coughs> European tradition of uh, subject philosophy? It is a uh, Cartesian subject, it is a uh, non human subject or a human subject. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yes. <laughs> Yes, well, for the important features, I try to spell them out in the, in the lecture somehow. But it's precisely this, uh, that the subject emerges at the impossibility of substance being itself. That it cannot, substance cannot close on itself. There is a self-othering of the substance. I mean, self-othering can be the, the other name for the subject. What pushes every entity into this self-uttering? Well, another name for this is a subject. There is no external violence that is done to any entity. It's the inner spring of, of, of any entity to become other than it is. It's never, it's never becoming other than it is on just on under the influence of other things. And this is completely opposed to the Spinozian idea of Conatus. If you, I don't know, philosophers said that, but Conatus is precisely the persistence of any entity in its present state, as it were. Uh, uh, corresponding to the essence for Spinoza is Conatus, which is the force of persistence. Force of persistence, in, and, and if anything is to be destroyed or negated in Spinoza, it can only be from outside. There's no internal negativity in entities, in Spinoza. In Hegel, the very internal kernel of any entity is a negative. It pushes it beyond itself. Not from, not from any other, not from another source, another thing which will die the violence to an entity. 
As to placing the Hegelian subject in, uh, in the history of uh, modern philosophy, you know, it's a subject for a PhD, for several PhDs, I think, actually. And um, there's no simple, quick way of answering this. But, uh, okay, if you, let's say that uh, there is a handy way of periodizing, but it's a, there's always something wrong with periodization. Um, Periodization, I think, is a big uh, disease of the university discourse. What do you do in university discourse? You always periodize. You, know? you don't, don't know what to do, you periodize. No? And you know the, the Slovene uh, group Leibach? I think they were actually, they were, they, they were, they were yes. here in St. Petersburg a few weeks ago, I think. Huh? In, in one interview, they said, our development went through three stages. Yeah. <laughs> the first one, the second one, and the third one. <laughs> I think it's a brilliant line. I mean, it's a brilliant line against periodization. You know? My development went through three stages. The first one, the second one, and the third one. Um, so, okay. But if we do this rule of thumb periodization, so things did start in a new way with Descartes. And one way of uh, stating this Cartesian revolution is that before that, you dealt with the human, let's say, as it, um, under the notions of uh, the soul, of individuality, of personality, and it's only with Descartes that it, we, what he introduced is the notion of a subject. Okay? It's only Descartes that we, we can speak of, subject is a modern entity. It hasn't been there since ever. And yes, yes as you said in the beginning, that uh, subject was actually uh, the Latin translation of Aristotle's Hippocamion. So it had a very different kind of impact if you said in Latin subject. So subject is a modern entity. And what did Descartes do? Um, why is Cartesian subject a subject? It's because it, we arrive at the subjectivity at the moment of Cogito when we discard everything. We discard all, all supports in the external world all supports in, in the hitherto knowledge, all supports in God, all supports in eternal truth. So it's an emptied out. It's completely emptied out. It has no psychological properties. It's not, it has no human properties in some sense. It, it's just an emptied out, uh, emptied out subject. And uh, okay, Slavoj Žižek has in some of his books says, uh, subject is the crack in the edifice of being. I think he used this, uh, this sentence in various books. But um, it's, you, you, so you start, it, what Descartes enabled is to think about the subject as a crack, actually. Not as a positive entity, but as a negative crack. Okay? When you discard everything being and present in the subject, you actually get to this, to this uh, pure caesura, pure break. Okay? Subject is a break. So, in this sense, yes, uh, Hegel is a post-Cartesian post thinker. It's, it's only on the basis of Cartesian subject that he can say substance is subject. He does use it in this inhuman way, a non-human way. And, uh, well, of course you have a long trajectory to there. And you mentioned Kant, of course, and uh, Kant tried to make... Okay. You know, in Descartes, at first, you know, the first thing in Descartes, the, the, Descartes in some way discovered this, but also screwed it up because he attached subject to the big other god and made then from subjectivity res cogitans. Yeah? It's not he made uh, the thinking the thinking thing. Yeah? Subject became a thing in Descartes uh, himself, and in. In Kant, you have a very different kind of setting where the, this nothingness of the subject begins, becomes the transcendental condition of any cognition of our access to the world. It becomes a universal kind of structure which, which allows us an access to positive being. And in Hegel, I think this uh, sentence, subset and subject, is actually very unique. That you don't have a subject which would allow you access to being somewhere over there, against, over against the subject. Because in Kant you have this. Here we are, and there is the world. 
how do we know the world, on what conditions? Huh? And, and then you see, okay, this still spells out the, the conditions, the transcendental conditions of any access to the world and knowledge, etc., etc. But in Hegel, Hegel is not a transcendentalist. Huh? In Hegel, subject is already in the world. It's part of the substance. It's, it, it, it's included in the movement of the substance. You don't have a subject over here and the world over there. And the, he, substance is subject it precisely means that the subject is inscribed in this world, is part of it, is part of the same dialectics. So, yes. And this, I, th I think this is a very unique position. This is a very unique position in the history of philosophy, that you conceive of subject in this way. And this is why I tried to pin into these notions, okay, metaphors of torsion and cut. Are sort of structural notions. They're not uh, subject is definitely not human. It is that in being which then allows also for human subjectivity. But it's there way before in also the Hegel's system. It is way before we can start speaking about the structure of human subjectivity. Lena. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we, when we come to research formulas, Hegel's formulas that uh, the substance is subject, where uh, uh, spirit is a bone. Uh, my first ironic question was like, uh, could it work the same way uh, with uh, the second formula? Spirit is a bone, so. Could we got a nervous uh, figure in the end of the such uh, um, argumentation? But um, actually, when I uh, was thinking uh, once again, I I, uh, uh, I, I think I, I have uh, like a real question <laughs> because um, uh, in your article the risky moment um, about. Uh, um, uh, about Freud and uh, Kafka, uh, you um, concentrate on one moment, like uh, between the mm -hmm. uh, dream and the reality, and you say that this moment is very risky. It's kind of you never know uh, where you where you like what subject <coughs> you will become. Uh, in the end of the process, like in, the, in this moment. And um, uh, Gregor Zanza uh, awaked uh, as, a, as an ex insect. And, um, so uh, the question is, uh, could, um, could we see some uh, uh, risk for the whole Hegelian machine? Nowadays, like, uh, could the bone become spirit, or um, could this subject and substance, like uh, I don't know, uh, become become broken or something? What do you think about that? Thank you. The subject and substance, which are already premised on the break, can a break get broken? <laughs> is this what you're asking? <laughs> It's like uh, disappearing or disappearing also. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes. The first, uh, yes. If you refer to this uh, paper of mine on the riskiest moment, there I speak of this experience of waking up, and then like waking up in Kafka, you wake up in the wrong universe, and the waking up is the riskiest moment because you. Um, you don't you risk of not waking up in the constituted reality. There is a moment of risk, there's a moment of wavering, there's a moment between the dream and the constituted reality. So it's an ontological ontological indecision there. And it can only last for a moment, a limited amount of time. And uh, if they say that psychoanalysis is about analysis of dreams, etc. I think more interesting uh, view of psychoanalysis is it's about awakening. 
It's about the logic of awakening. What do we awake to? How we are? How we can awake to something? And uh, Lacan says actually that the moment of awakening is is this moment of the missed, always missed encounter with the real. You have one kind of reality, which is the dream reality. You have another kind of reality, which is constituted reality. There is a crack in between where this moment of real appears. And I'm okay summarizing this argument because uh, this connects with the first question which was asked. Uh, is there a moment that uh, Hegel doesn't cover? I do think that Hegel doesn't quite cover this moment. Yes, mm-hmm. but there is this crack. There is this crack. There's some real which appears in this crack between two worlds. No? That uh, that is a very modern experience. It's a very modern experience, and this is why I bring up uh, Freud and Kafka and also Proust and some other modernist, uh, modernist authors, including Malevich and Duchamp and Schoenberg and Stravinsky. And then as a, as a, this moment of awakening, this moment of this wavering, in a certain historical moment, just prior to the First World War, which is a very modern experience. And I don't think that you can speak of this experience in Hegel. Yeah? You can speak of it in certain traditional ways, but I think that something did happen with modernity. Some, we were shifted with modernity. And that modernism is an important concept. And I think that Freud, in the whole psychoanalysis, is inscribed in the movement of modernism, this shift of experience. It was only enabled at that particular time. Yeah? It's, it's always like this. There's a discovery of psychoanalysis, and then it seems it was valid since ever. Yeah? We... In 1900, Freud discovered some truth which was valid uh, 2,000 years before Christ already, or since ever humanity is there. But this is always an illusion, a retroactive illusion, that something you discover now has always already been there. No? But the fact that you discovered it now is conditioned by a very particular historical moment. A historical moment is not our limitation. No? It's the contingency of the historical moment which allows us to reach for for truth, is it there? And Hegel's notion of absolute knowledge, huh? this is why I love this notion. It's not like absolute knowledge which would float above history and be true for every possible historical epoch. Hegel's own theory of absolute knowledge is that this absolute knowledge could emerge only at that particular moment. It's only then that it was possible. And it's this uh, short circuit between contingency and the absolute. It's only the contingent condition which can produce the absolute. The absolute which seems to be valid all over and has been, always been there, that's an empty absolute. This is not interesting for Hegel. So it's always contingent. Mm-hmm. Я материалист, мы можем быть только материалистами, и наша материя — это означающая. И это означает... а, подождите, можно я первую часть переведу? Uh, so, um, as you said, uh, Hegel, uh, as you noticed, some, uh, we noticed mm-hmm. some proximity between Hegel and Lacan, and uh, uh, Lacan was uh, always saying that uh, he is a materialist and we are the materialists, but our materialism is the materialism of the signifier. Uh, what if, uh, in order to save this connection between uh, um, Hegel and Lacan on the one hand and the materialism of the signifier on the other, we, oh my God, yeah, but, uh, uh, we, uh, последнее, um, the last one. Um, um, 
Uh, so we, uh, we, um, The, the, the sense uh, <laughs> just <laughs> um, we can uh, divide нет разложить как сказать нет разложить a discern between uh, between topology and uh, topology of what um, Um, so the uh, the idea is that topology on the one hand and the the, the materialism of the signifier are maybe uh, two things that uh, compose the the substance a subject proposition. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, yes. You got <laughs> 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 uh, no, one start with yes. <laughs> it's a good opening. Um, first of all, uh, you... Of course, Lacan always stood for materialism. But uh, his various texts, his various... Uh, pronouncements about materialism don't go quite in the same direction. And on the one hand, there is indeed, he spoke about the materialism of the signifier. And this would be enough for materialism. That materialism should be based on, on, on the signifier. And it, this already raises some questions. Which, what, do, what exactly do we mean by signifier? Do we mean the Saussurean signifier, the negativity, the differentiality? And this is what Lacan initially meant. Um, there, there was a signifier represents a subject for another signifier. This is a very Hegelian sentence. The, the, the notion of subject, which is encapsulated in this, is a very Hegelian notion of subject. One can, one can somehow map this on, on Hegel. But there is a different kind of signifier, which is the question of la langue. No? La langue, which is the erratic nature of signifiers which contingently sound alike and resonate and can encounter each other, but it's completely contingent. If you say signifier is a differential entity, this is uh, the level of the necessary. If you say signifier as la langue, it's a level of erratic and contingent. It's, there's no way to predict how certain words resonate with each other in in different languages, and there is homonymy, and homonymy is very much a condition of the of the unconscious, because the unconscious always uses the natural terrain, so quasi-natural terrain of language, in order to produce informations. That is, it uses the homonymies, the homonymies in particular languages. This is why every language has a different kind of unconscious, you know? and for the unconscious is is based not on some repressed deep meaning, but on contingent encounter of sounds. This is another kind of materialism we are speaking about. This is one materialism of the signifier as signifier representing the subject for another signifier. And there is another kind of thing when we speak of Lanangu. But I think there is a third kind of materialism, which Lacan sometimes speak about, which is the, the materialism of the object. And this is where he abandons the idea that the signifier is a good starting base for thinking about materialism. It's actually the object which is the problem. The object which is precisely not, cannot be seized by the signifier, which goes beyond the symbolic. So the, the, finally, the materialism should be the materialism of the real. And the real is precisely not something that coincides with any given reality, the thing that appears in these cracks cannot be solidified, cannot be turned into a substance. Huh? And which is, again coming to the first question, something that perhaps cannot be captured by this notion of substance is subject. Huh? So this materialism of the real would be maybe something that goes beyond the scope of this uh, substance is subject. Otherwise, the, the question about topology, which uh, continue the question you asked me in the Freud Museum, um, 
I think that uh, um, it's it's um, one way of conceiving, and actually also the way that I pursue it in the, in the end. One way of conceiving subject is subject is is by turning ontology into topology, and this is why I proposed in the end the Mebius trick. So that you don't have a different ontological notion of substance uh, and what is subject in relation to it, but actually you propose a topological model, a topological model which gives a new, very spatial placement, a spatial placement of, of the subject in the movement of, of substance. And I, I think Hegel, in some way, does propose a topological model. It's a new topology of knowledge. It's not, uh, as I said, it's not different words. He uses the same words, but the topology of these words is different. They topologically shift. Huh? The words which were supposed to be on two opposed sides in the whole tradition suddenly find themselves on a mobile strip, on the same surface. And the opposition is only the opposition of the uh, front side and flip side of the mobile strip. So, I, question, I think the question of topology is, is important, I guess. That it, it's a good guideline. Mm. Uh, I want to continue the discussion about... Uh, about nothing. <laughs> ...reality and illusion. And maybe if I would invite you, uh, you will discuss with Saksana about uh, self and reality. And... Um, is a self is a, a, a reality if uh, someone lives in his self but don't live uh, with another people and many people uh, don't um, exist uh, for uh, uh, maybe more short. Uh, I uh, want to conclude uh, in that and um, what you say beginning that um, um, reality this process of confrontations uh, of uh, reality it is not um, it is a process uh, and uh, I, I will say that <coughs> when I heard you and when I think about what you say I think that um, uh, to be in reality to be uh, if I in reality and we in reality if we in confrontation and uh, to be exist is uh, to be perceptible uh, uh, if, but uh, if I didn't uh, percept you um, I isn't in reality and if I isn't confronted uh, with you I isn't in reality Не по-русски, но очень короткое одно предложение, несложное. Да. Да. В начале доклада я слышал, вы говорили о том, что главный принцип, ну, ориентироваться на то, в чем истина, это если есть противоречие. Если... Ну, so, the, you, said, uh, you said truth in, is in the contradiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Вот. Ну и, соответственно, дальше был разговор о том, что, если я правильно услышал, может, я фантазию забыл. Человек а, не живет в реальности, когда он думает, что вот я существую, я есть, как бы, и больше никого нету. Я подумал, может быть, быть в реальности, прежде всего, если речь идет о субъекте, то есть о человеке, его яркое, его чувство, тематические субъекты связаны. Это то, что а, вокруг столкновений между людьми, вокруг противоречий, когда они видят друг друга. Иначе нет никакой ну, реальности, субъекта. Maybe he says, um, maybe to really exist in reality means to be involved in uh, contradictions and confrontations. Uh, that's what is to be a human being, um, a human in reality. Sure. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> um, when Hegel says the contradiction is the index of truth, he doesn't mean... Um, just humans, he means that any entity is actually bound up, permitted with contradiction. It goes for 
for everything. That uh, contradiction is a universal condition of the world, no? as opposed to the Aristotelian tradition. That, uh, so in the, the, the minimal condition that something must fulfill is to be non-contradictory, in order to exist, in order to be true. No? So um, the question of um, if one is in confrontation with other people in the social, or not perceived in the social or isolated. I mean, this, this comes somewhere much later in this theory of contradiction. Of course, it's very, it's a very, um, is it, this is where contradiction gets very real, it, it, because it concerns our social being, well, in what way we can be in interaction and contradiction with other people, and we can only be in this interrelation and confrontation we can only exist in this and of course uh, isolating oneself from society is a very social act it's not an act of uh, just uh, being alone on a robinson island um, the fact that you isolate yourself is also uh, a way of dealing with social confrontation um, Don't, you, one can't get out of it. Перевести или не надо? Ну, короче, смотрите, а, а, короче, смотрите, это а, противоречие, это вообще не про людей, не про человеческое, а вообще про все. А, но, а, конечно, когда речь заходит о человеческом обществе, это вот теория противоречия, это уже такая она уже на, на довольно продвинутом уровне она обретает какую-то такую реальность свою. И, конечно, вот даже, например, изоляцию или такое дистанцирование от общества можно рассматривать как конфронтацию, потому что из этого нет никакого в общем, выхода. момент, который обсуждался в Кафку и врата закона, как раз именно об этом, что человек а, только так может войти в реальность, когда он нарушит границы. То есть до тех пор, пока он в своем воображении видит, что ему что-то запрещено, ну еще там начальник или кто-то такой свободу, он как бы в нереальности находится, не субъективировался ему так. А вот когда а, первый шаг по нарушению каких-то а, пределов и границ, He suggests that for a human being, the, the only way to freedom uh, and the, the only way to reality uh, is the transgression of the law. Uh, like in Kafka, uh, in, in order to get into this um, this risky moment of the real, uh, he has to transgress a certain, to violate the, the paternal uh, law. Um. Transgression is a very difficult thing to achieve. <laughs> it's, not, it's not easy to transgress. And um, uh, first of all, in, in Kafka, you can see that uh, people don't transgress. I mean, the, Door, the gates of the law are open, but the guy doesn't go in, although there is nothing to prevent him. And um, in the castle, I mean, the guy never gets to the castle, although there is nothing to prevent him. Yeah? So the, the problem of Kafka is not how we would transgress the law, but how we are, it, by our internal desires, trapped in the law. It's not like we have a desire to transgress the law and then there's a question of courage to go beyond. I mean, all, all Kafka's uh, heroes are actually immanent to the law. They don't transgress the law. There's a question of immanence in Kafka. And I think the Deleuze and Gattari book on Kafka actually shows this very well. There's a the immanence of desire which is being played out. It's not a transgression of the law. 
And as for transgression of the law, there is a, this whole clinical entity in psychoanalysis with the question of perversion, which transgresses the usual laws of normal sexual behavior. But uh, neither Freud nor Lacan ever thought that transgression was subversive. It's a transgression which is very well adapted to the law. It's a transgression which can actually enforce the law, can actually sustain the law. The law lives through its transgressions. It's not so easy to be transgressive. I mean, the one who greatly believed in transgression was Bataille. Famously, Oksana wrote a book on Bataille. Did her PhD on Bataille. Mm. So in, in this uh, in this sense, aggression of transgression, Lacan and Bataille were not, I mean, who knew each other, who were friends and many ways collaborated. Uh, they they saw things differently. Bataille believed in the transgression of the law. Lacan never thought that transgression of the law would be simply redemptive. Вот, короче, по Лакану, в общем, трансгрессия, ну, вообще трансгрессия это не так уж и просто, хотя Батай вот думал, что это просто. В этом разница, например, между Батаем и Лаканом, и такие друзья были. И Кавка, и Лакан показывают имманентность закона и желание. Тот факт, что из закона просто так нельзя выбраться. Ну, поэтому вот у врат закона, например, как раз об этом притча. Я так коротко резюмировала. Катя. What could be strategies nowadays for an artist to to proceed? Because uh, like, what is this blind spot? Important blind spot? Or is it just like not to fall into the irony of of a hipster, but to be that on the level of existence and still uh, and still act uh, and. Well, it's very tempting to, to, to hear the lectures of, uh, well, philosophical lectures, but the, the education of, like, what is the, well, like, multiple questions here, but, like, what could be, what could be this blindness uh, without the, how does it, how does it apply the temptation of, education on one hand and on the other like not not like the temptation of simplification thing like how do you think a strategy can right well what should be the strategy for modern now basically yeah, yeah, yeah. you want me to no, no, I, I, give a simple no, response to this just, no no it's, it's not it's not a guideline i'm asking you but maybe you're I saw you had a guideline some, somewhere. <laughs> there was an interview uh, where you <laughs> ah, yeah, right. explained okay. what okay. artists okay. should do. No, no, this like, was... Uh, fail, fail harder next time, you know? There's, there's, fail harder. There's, fail better. Yeah. Fail better. <laughs> or, like, how to... Also, because on the, on the, uh, the seminar, how do you call it, the seminar, mm -hmm. uh, we compare the, the book with a, with a computer game at levels. So each level is a, is a death of a of an imaginary Same. hero. But we, yes. I only have one, you know. So the thing is that probably I imagine I imagine an action is is a, is a very is the blindest of the blind spots, you know. So I just really need to get closer to the to death as much as I can, and then just die significantly significantly in a way, you know? So Yes. yes. <laughs> Again yes. <laughs> We're better gonna say it than yes. <laughs> no, uh, no, um, well well <laughs> first thing to say is of course as an artist you are in a very different position. But also in the but also we are in the same boat. 
but uh, the starting point, um, I don't, you know, there's a label. Um, art is a dirty job, but somebody has to do it. <laughs> As an artist, you have to get your hands dirty. Philosophers have this uh, yeah, illusion that we some. Yeah, I don't have this we thing. You know, like I, I can. Well, I think there's just this division between we and this this acting guy. You know, this Mario, who he is, whoever he is. You know, like, Super Mario. Yeah, Super Mario. Yes, and then we have we, and we are eating popcorn and celebrating this Mario's really like really. Working hard, and, <laughs> and then you boom, and and okay, then and then but, <laughs> you understand? Uh, the thing is, uh, Mario, Mario has to Mario has yeah, right. to really slow down a bit, you know, not to die at well, just for the first step. So, uh, on the other hand, education, educated artist is something. Is somebody um, playing safe in a way, you know? If mm -hmm. I if I'm quite, like like being not a compromiser, but like getting his value higher, you know, by capitalizing his. <laughs> no, I understand. <laughs> and other, and other. Too many questions. <laughs> yeah, too many questions. So how I, to make Mario uh, more entertaining? Um, okay, good thing I have kids, so I have some introduction. I had some introduction to, to uh, computer games. <laughs> um, well, first of all, um, they, I mean, we put in this very general level the, the question of philosophy and what we're doing here, the question of art. It's uh, we start, of course, from very different positions, and um, of course the. Philosophy starts with concepts, with universalities. But they are only worth something if they can touch, if they can touch the, some weird, some particularity, some singularity, if they can have, have extension. And I somehow profoundly, I mean, I wouldn't be a philosopher otherwise, I profoundly believe they, they can. And that um, the ideas can make a difference, can have far-reaching consequences. On the other hand, art always starts with the singular, with the material, with the particular material. In order to do what? To, to produce universality out of it. It's only if it has a universal address, universal appeal, that it can be called art. But you start from a different end. You start with a diff very <coughs> material. Conceptual art starts with an idea. Yes, well, conceptual art. Um, I often ask myself, uh, where is the concept? I love conceptual art, but <laughs> only the concept part somehow <laughs> confuses <laughs> me. <laughs> Sorry, I have this uh, philosophical disease, you know, that um, no, okay. imagine, imagine cons uh, have some precise, Im precise yeah, idea yeah, about yeah. what the concept is. You know, that yeah. It's very quickly, it's so quick to call something conceptual art. You know? yeah. uh, but so never mind. I mean, uh, I, I, no, I, I think that, uh, yes, that art deals with very singular materiality. It's very, I mean, it's, it's in this way. It demands indeed a high uh, proficiency education in order to be able to deal with these materials, but also it has to somehow, in the end, have a universal appeal. How does some, something completely singular have a universal appeal? This is the mystery of art. Eh? Is any art is, art is great precisely with singularity. This, this precise way it's, it's, made, it's put together, these precise colors, these precise tones. And nevertheless, you produce something that reaches far beyond this material in this particular historical moment. Right? So this is how, okay, philosophers and artists are on the same boat, but actually looking at the thing from two different sides, you know, from different, it's a different kind of um, uh, training practice that one, one needs for this. And your question of the education in art is, of course, uh, Oh, in a way, it's, uh, it's what one called the million dollars question, you know, that how can you educate in art um, since art is precisely one thing that perhaps you can't quite learn, you know, but you need a lot of education to come there. <laughs> it's not, uh, art as such cannot be taught, but you need a lot of education in order for, 
to come to this point. Yeah? Um, the question of blind spot. I return to the thing I said previously. I think everybody has blind spots. Every position has blind spots. But I don't see this as a deficiency. I think that the, the question of blind spot could, should also be taken literally as a blind spot in the eye. But what is a blind spot in the eye? Well, everybody has a blind spot in the eye. But this is the blind spot which enables seeing. It's because we have a blind spot that we can see. So it's the same as philosophy or result. It's because we have certain blind spots, because structurally don't see some things. But this is not a deficiency. This is what enables us to see what we see, and to do what we do. Yes, absolutely. absolutely, I agree, but I think that blind spots is something to gain first, and then to try to... To gain see. a blind spot. No, yes, no, no, I, mean, I, I like mean this. That, I, mean I like this. A, I, yeah. I mean, like, just to... But it's very hard to fool yourself. You, don't, you're, you, 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 you see nothing because it looks like you know everything and, everything, and all information is accessible, and, you know, like, how is that and wrote everything already so I mean there's so much so like what what's next and then this next you speak about capitalism you want to speak about blind spots <laughs> blind spots <laughs> like uh, no, no, an I awakening to something actually <laughs> no no I, I I like this idea that the blind spot is not something to be rid of which is the usual way of speaking about it but it's actually a privilege to be gained yeah. It's, it's a very good form. Okay. Can I? <laughs> um, I think it's a nice um, point to uh, to uh, close this uh, conversation, uh, formal conversation. Maybe we can continue with an informal one <coughs> if one has a desire. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>